Last week was kind of an introduction to generative models, uh, more generally speaking, or I guess you, you could say vanilla generative models, where we basically just have like this sort of random Z vector that we input into a, some sort of a, a neural network and then poof comes out an image. It might as well basically be like fairy dust, right? There's no structure to it. There's no constraints that we can add to it. And today we're going to start actually um, crafting mostly with the inputs, making some cons uh, crafting some constraints. And um, we'll talk about how to uh, condition on labels, condition on images, and um, basically today is like the picks to picks day. Um, and everybody's kind of familiar with that already. Um, and then, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of introduce what they are a little bit and how, how they work. We're not going to go into too much low level detail, but we are going to kind of just show a lot of different projects. This has been, uh, the stuff that we're showing today has been, I think, the big, like the wellspring of most of the machine learning oriented art over the last year or two. People have been using Pix to Pix mainly uh, because it gives us uh, like so many degrees of freedom in order to create interesting interesting uh, interactions. So I think you'll you'll probably see a lot of familiar stuff today. Um, so this is actually from vid to vid which is uh, just from, a, well, maybe a few months ago now. And I'll actually, I'll, I'll talk about that later today, uh, later in the slides. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. So uh, this Friday we're going to have uh, Helena Saren, uh, aka Glagolista from Twitter um, and Instagram, uh, basically on uh, in the so oh, we switched uh, rooms. So now there's a new, there's a class happening in the in room 15. So for, so now we're going to be in the in the what is that the the room by the elevators. So we're going to um, yeah we're going to have that that talk. On Friday here, for any of you who aren't familiar with Helena's work, she does a lot of really, really cool work, in particular using the methods that we're going to look at today. Um, so if you become interested in that, I highly, highly uh, recommend you join us on Friday. And a uh, little quick announcement for myself, I'm going to be back here in the spring, so that's kind of like confirmed, I'll be a resident again. And I'm going to run a, a um, two-point class for the first half of the spring semester called Autonomous Artificial Artists, and I'll, we'll get more into what that means in, in a couple of weeks. Like, that'll probably be the subject of the, the last lecture. Um, it's kind of an emerging, uh, an emerging class and topic area of interest for me, so, so I, I don't have too much I want to say about it right now, but, but we'll hear more about it in the last week of this, this class, I think. Um, yeah, so let's get into planning stuff. Um, so we basically have six more weeks to go including today so we're halfway through all of the classes now and so this is kind of a tentative schedule for the rest of the semester today we're going to look at conditional general models as i said next week i think i'll introduce the recurrent neural networks because those are you know very very fundamental to a lot of deep learning stuff and we'll talk about you know lstms and chatbots and all that kind of fun stuff and then um, week nine will probably, week, week eight and week nine will be kind of part of a unit of like audio and text uh, applications, I think. And, um, and so there will be kind of like a lot of miscellaneous stuff, let's say week nine. Um, some natural language processing stuff I want to introduce, maybe talk about word vectors and, and sentence vectors and things like that. And um, I think these three weeks will be the last of the really, really uh, usable uh, practical materials that you'll want to use for, for your presentations and your projects because um, when we get, because um, the, the last ones will be a little bit more speculative. Um, so we'll have a little gap week. So that's the week of, uh, so there'll be no class on Tuesday, November 20th. That's the week of Thanksgiving. I think you guys do have classes on Tuesdays, but that's one of the weeks that I have uh, a gap. I'll be out of town that week. So I won't be here. Uh, there won't be office hours and stuff. Um, we'll kind of reschedule those. When we get back, um, we'll be in our final three weeks, and then we'll talk about re we'll get into reinforcement learning. That's always a really really fun one. We're going to talk about games and things like that, and um, and we'll we'll do some practical stuff like some tutorials and maybe probably like Q learning, uh, and you know making AI agents that play games. And that stuff may still be, um, it may still be early enough that you might end up using it for, for projects, but I don't expect that it will necessarily be that useful to you. Week 11 will be like the last lecture and it'll be uh, introducing this autonomous artificial artist concepts and, and also maybe talking about 
um, kind of more intangible things like, okay, now that you're done this class, how do you move forward and how do you continue to kind of uh, keep up with the field and, and how to how to kind of be like a scientist artist, I guess you could say. And week 12, it's all you guys. I'm going to be, you know, back here chowing on popcorn and watching watching presentations. So that's going to be, that's basically the, the plan. Does anyone have any, any um, questions or comments on that? Mm -hmm. We're going to have to register for classes before week 11, and I'm wondering if mm -hmm. you want to like, give us a sneak peek. Yes. Um, I'll, let's, say, let's say I'll do that. Uh, come by on Friday um, to AI Lab. Oh, is it, is it like this week? A number of us are like, in a class. On okay, then, then come talk to me. Yeah, I, I don't want to talk about it right now because I don't have enough time. Yeah, yeah. But I'll, I'll, I'll definitely uh, just come talk to me. If, any, if anyone's interested, I'll, I, we should you know, maybe set aside some time and I can describe it. it it'll be, there's also a blurb in the, um, but yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's really quickly review what we talked about last week, since this week is kind of a continuation of it. Uh, we introduced this idea of generative models, and generative models are representational models of data sets that are capable of synthesizing new images and text and sounds and they learn this kind of uh, what we call a latent space which is kind of an embedding of all the possible images or sounds or text or whatever it is that you trained on um, it's a very very it tends to be very smooth and you see kind of continuous um, you know continuous variation of different features and um, they're becoming increasingly high resolution and high um, you know high fidelity just two and a half years ago, as recently as then, you could really not do anything besides for like 32 to 64 pixels, and now they're they're basically approaching HD. So that's a that's a lot of progress in a short amount of time. They're becoming increasingly realistic, um, as people have seen. More formally, they're basically you know, and this isn't a whole lot more formal than than the last slide, but basically this is just a you know we can consider these from the 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 most zoomed out perspective. We can consider these to be these kind of uh, neural networks that are trained on many, many images, let's say in the context of images, and then they're trained in order to accept an input vector, which is, you know, maybe, like I said, like fairy dust, basically just like random numbers, uh, which do encode sort of high level variations and uh, outcomes an image that looks like it came from the, from the data set. And we talked about in the context of images, the idea that, that uh, you can think of an image as a point in a very high dimensional space uh, where the dimensions are all of the numbers that represent the images, the pixel values basically. And of course this is a very, very vast and empty space because of the curse of dimensionality. And so uh, any generative model is tasked with first learning some sort of a low, um, like, a, like a low dimensional manifold let's say within the space of all you know within the larger space where most of the points are kind of centered right so like all of these different generative models that we looked at they're all trying to trying to encode these uh points in a in a much uh more compact uh meaningful representation right so and we talked about how principal component analysis is a simple strategy towards doing that the simplest one um but certainly not the most efficient one uh, and then we talked about eigenfaces, which is principal component analysis applied to applied to a data set of faces. We embedded faces inside of this latent space, which is characterized by the principal components. Um, and then we, we, we talked about how as you try to reduce the amount of principal components that you keep, the, um, the details are the first things that go. So like the sort of the small details, let's say, and you're left with uh, just the most average features that the, that the network is, is capable of memorizing. We talked about autoencoders, right, which is basically the same thing as PCA, except nonlinear, because it's using a neural network. Uh, and you can see that, that, that um, autoencoders, you know, you, you, you see the encoding part in the first half of this network and the decoding part in the second half. We're trying to reduce the, the information into a small set of um, what are analogous to principal components, except in autoencoders, we don't call them that. Um, they're just, you know, this latent space, these, these latent vectors that, that are the embedding of the images in the, in the smallest possible uh, space. And then um, the decoder then takes those codes, we can call them latent codes, and then um, out come, come images. And autoencoders are 
pretty good at doing this. They're better at, than PCA, but they're still a little bit blurry and they tend not to. Um, it, well, they have a lot of nice properties, but they tend not to produce the the most, uh, let's say, aesthetically pleasing, um, according to most estimates, I guess. Uh, it's, it's a highly subjective question, actually. It's very difficult to, turns out that it's very difficult to measure formally, but, uh, but we don't like how they look as much. Um, in any case, like they do give us a nice embedding. We talked about this idea of latent spaces being embeddings of images of all of the images, let's say, um, that are possible that can possibly be generated. Well, this this doesn't make sense because um, <laughs> those aren't the synthetic images; those are the real images. But okay, the encoder can take those images and then encode them into a low-dimensional space like that, um, and. Yeah, so this is the auto, like a high-level view of autoencoders. You have this encoder and decoder element. Um, then we talked about generative adversarial networks, and those are very similar to autoencoders, except they're kind of like, they're almost like um, maybe inverted a little bit. So now the, the, you could say the discriminator is kind of doing what the encoder was doing before. Not exactly, well, the generator is kind of like the decoder in an autoencoder, but it's, but it's, uh, now, instead of being fed from an, from an encoder, there actually is no encoder now. There's just this discriminator network that basically tells apart real images from fake images. These uh, two networks are trained adversarially, adversarially to each other, and uh, which is a really, really strange, uh, like relatively new concept, this idea of adversarial training within neural networks. It makes it's it's a little bit of a hack it makes a lot of things like difficult to for a machine learning scientist difficult to to sort of evaluate properly and so there's lots of like there's lots of controversy over whether these are dead end or not but for uh, for us we're really excited about them because they make amazing images yeah so yeah i just want to ask like the so are the, the dcdn that you showed us um effectively using this the same model yeah um, so i mean during the process of training it's not like it's not behaving like an autoencoder on the generator side. Like, what what point does the data set that we give it get distilled, so to speak? I don't. What do you mean by distilled? Um, I mean it has. It's generating from something, right? Sure, sure. Um, so isn't that isn't it getting encoded before it's starting to generate? Or the generator, all it does is it takes in some random numbers, basically, like an input vector. See at the top there. Right. There's nothing connecting to that. Right. Um, so the way it's trained is that you input some random numbers, it generates an image and then sends it to the discriminator and the, the discriminator. The discriminator has the data set, essentially. The discriminator, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. They both, yeah. yeah. And like, but there was also no way when we wanted to output samples to give it values in Z, or that's sort of a different? No, no, of course you, you can, yeah, yeah. That's the whole point, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. there, that was possible with it, the in the DC GAN repository, uh, if you look at the code, it, it just makes random Z vectors, right. and you can start to modify that. I have a notebook in the ML4A guides that shows how to make interpolations and things like that, so you can take a look at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually, uh, we'll, talk, we'll maybe get um, in the second half of today, we'll talk about the DC GAN thing, implementation again, because there's some stuff that you maybe we didn't, we glossed over really quickly last week. Like okay, how do you how do you actually work with these z vectors? And, and um, I do have a notebook for for working with that. So 2015, we started seeing things like this, and you know we had seen generated faces before with eigenfaces, not encoders, but not so crisp. Um, and uh, of course, just it, just over two years later, uh, we had basically like uh, 1024 by 1024 hyper realistic faces with stubble and hair follicles and glints in the eyes and all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, this is just some of the original DC GAN stuff. Alec Radford making album covers. Um, I showed you a book from the sky um, and uh, manga characters and flowers and, you know, lots of people doing cool things uh, with DC GANs. Your cohort here, Sam Haynes, uh, making uh, training DC GANs on unliked Instagram photos. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, two, two years later, we had, uh, we were able to get up to 1024 by 1024 resolution, much more realistic, things like bicycles and cars and memes um, and, yeah, and bedrooms and so on. Uh, that's progressively grown. And this is, these, these um, this rep there's an online repository that you, you could make, you could actually use this instead of DCGAN repository if you wish. 
the downside is that it requires enormous amounts of compute, um, which can be a little bit hard to to assemble. We'll um, probably not today, but maybe at one of these AI labs, we might we might try to talk about strategies for cost effectively uh, assembling lots and lots of GPUs to make to train things like this. Um, you guys do have access to the HPC, so that's one thing that, that would be worth our while to maybe to cover. Um, I showed you this that I'm working on. There's a progressively grown GAN on WikiArts. So it's amazingly, um, like, you can throw anything at it. You know, if you have tons and tons of images that are completely, like, extremely heterogeneous, um, like, like paintings and all different styles, it's able to just, like, internalize all of that and really, um, like, yeah, I'm still really impressed with the capacity but, of these things to learn. Yeah. only because the data set is massive, right? I mean, given how well, um, there's there's more to it. There's also like just the size of the sheer size of the network itself, uh, because if you, I think some of you who have been training DC GANs this week, you might have noticed that if you feed it images, that there's no sort of like, there's no story exactly. There's just lots and lots of different kinds of images. It it can't do very much. It like it like tries to learn everything, but it hedges its bets and it just gets sort of abstract stuff. Um, so capacity is a, is a, is a big issue. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Like the size of the network, literally the size. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is, it's not this past week anymore. This, this slide is out of date. It was like a month ago now, but these were big GANs. There's no source code now, but NVIDIA told us that, that um, all you have to do is, is uh, like have 256 GPUs or something like that. And uh, you can make like uh, hyper-realistic stuff. Now the thing is, it's worth our, we're not going to be able to make this anytime soon. But it's worth our while to, to understand this because usually there's a, there's, a, there's a common theme, which is that things that were really, really, uh, that really, really expensive to train uh, will become much less expensive like re relatively quickly. Uh, maybe it's not quite the same case as it was like a few years ago, but we're making uh, the, a lot of these things get trained. Like usually someone will just throw a computer at a problem and then demonstrate some something new that we haven't seen before, like hyper-realism. Um, and then other people will come along and figure out how to do it more efficiently. Um, and of course, like our access to GPU resources is climbing. Um, so I think pretty soon you'll be able to generate stuff like this. In fact, in another two years, it might be trivial to generate stuff like this. You might be doing it on, on an app on your phone. And so when everyone in the world can do this, right? Um, then, then, well, things will become very interesting, I suppose. Uh, we talked about generative models in other domains, three um, point clouds, uh, audio, wave nets. I don't know if any of you got a chance to look at the TensorFlow wave net implementation. That's another thing that you may be interested in trying to train um, if you're interested in audio stuff. Okay, so now let's get into talking about um, conditional generative models. And, and the first thing I want to do is really quickly talk about the idea of image to image transformations, right? So everyone recognizes these like Instagram filters and you know that the way that they work is relatively straightforward. There's some sort of like a, either some sort of a one-to-one -one pixel mapping, like color to color mapping to get these filters or you might have like like some small kernels that, that might compute something locally and then change the colors based on that. So these are like relatively simple, uh, you know, filters that you can apply. Uh, but if you want to make an Im uh, but okay, well, that's a very, very, uh, that's an image to image transformation that you can code explicitly, right? But what if you're interested in more complex image to image transformations? Like for example, changing the season of an image, right? So going from a winter image and then changing it to its equivalent summer image, right? Or vice versa. Well, um, so that's obviously very, very difficult to achieve in some sort of a pixel-to-pixel -pixel lookup. You need to do something much more, uh, much more comp complex. And um, that's kind of what we're interested in. And that will be the, um, that's not uh, conditional generative models. I, I mean that in a much broader sense. That's kind of like a catch-all term to conditioning generative models on, on, on things other than, you know, random numbers. Uh, but this will, but this in particular, image to image conditioning on an input image, will be the thing that we that is going to be the biggest part of today. Um, so again, like just to review, basic generative models work like this. 
uh, they have this z vector, right? We always, we, we, by convention, we label it z. And you know, it's going to be some 10 or 100 or 1,000 dimensional vector, let's say, which uh, for our purposes um, is more or less random. Um, and uh, now it's random in the sense that it, it's, it's not, well, each of those elements in, the, in that input vector do have some correspondence to, the, to a high level feature, right? But it's trained randomly, and so the way that that actually ends up sorting itself out is not really uh, something that we have much control over. Uh, now there are like um, I think I briefly mentioned last week, like like for example, InfoGAN, and there's different exotic varieties of GANs which do impose some sort of structure so that Z is is um, more meaningful to us, but um, but you know the, they're relatively limited in that sense. Now, um, now we did talk about conditioning generative models on labels. So, for example, um, if you if you you can do this with the DC GAN repository, and it doesn't make it super easy for you. Annoyingly, you have to look at the code. But, but um, the way they do it for MNIST, for example, uh, but you can um, set up a DC GAN so that it takes in alongside the um, uh, alongside the uh, images uh, a label. And then once you once you you can train it so that it's conditioned on the label, um, so then you can generate an image not just uh, from Z, but then you also input a Y vector, which is the label itself. And Y is like let's say you have class labels, so there's you know ten digits, then then Y is you is uh, generally structured as what's called a one hot vector. So like let's say you have ten there's ten classes here, the ten digits. So then your Y label uh, is basically a 10 dimensional vector of zeros, except one for the, for the class that it is. So if you're, going, if you're going from zero to nine and you have an image of a two, then it would be zero, zero, one, zero, 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 zero so on. Um, now, uh, that's, how it's, that's how it's trained. But then you can do whatever you want for generating. Then you input Y into the generator and you know, you, if you want to produce a four, you put in zero, 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 what is it? One, zero, 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 and so on. Um, but you could also do like 0 0.5 on the four and 0 0.5 on the six. And then you'll get some sort of a glyph, which is like halfway between four and six. Without giving it a Z? Uh, no, well, you still give it a Z. It has to take in a Z. But, but the point is that, you know, and, and then you can modify Z also. Um, Z will still control the high-level features that are independent of the labels to some degree, um, and uh, but Y will modulate the actual label. Um, so this this video here that you're seeing with the image is just made by uh, holding Z fixed. Uh, Z is probably fixed. It doesn't have to be, but let's say Z is fixed, and then Y is basically going like gradually from from a one hot vector of zero to a one hot vector of one. So it interpolates between them and then it interpolates between one and two and interpolates between two and three and so on. Uh, and you can do that for, for that, that's the way that the, a book from the sky is made as well. Um, uh, now you can condition uh, like the labels, right? Don't have to be class labels. It can be a label of any sort, right? Um, so for example, I showed you this this work uh, where they were conditioning these generative models on fMRI activity. Now, fMRI activity is not a class label. Uh, it's you know maybe I, I don't know exactly what it is. You can see that you know it's like whatever that is, right? I don't know what these actually correspond to, brain waves or whatever. But um, you have some vector of brain wave activities, and that becomes your label. So your label doesn't have to be a one hot vector. It can be something more complicated. Um, and um, and so there's a lot of of course there's like a lot of potential in that. Um, now uh, that is if you have a class label. Now what about these image to image uh, filters, right? Well, there you have uh, instead of a Y. Well, you can also have a Y, but but um, but uh, in this case you have an X now, like you have an input image. So now the the generator. Is conditioned on a uh, on an input image, which is almost definitely the same size as the output image. It doesn't have to be actually. Uh, like for example, you could do super resolution this way, so then then the input and output don't match in size. But most of these will be where they match in size. So like let's say you have a data set of of shoes. Uh, this actually this is kind of wrong. So the, 
the the data set I have above there looks like actual generated objects. It should be actual shoes, but I just didn't I couldn't find them. Um, so so let's say you have a data set of shoes and sketches of those shoes, right? And they're parallel, so they're like perfectly parallel. Then you can um, then you can train one of these so that you input a sketch of a shoe and it produces the colored shoe, right? Um, very exciting, right? So <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's that's basically what we mean by these image uh, image to image networks. Um, now the this now uh, of course like to some degree uh, we've already seen stuff like this. So so style transfer is really kind of like this, right? You have some input image, and then it produces some output image, which is you know the same image except in a different style. Um, but but the first um, as far as I know the first like uh, code base or project that tried to implement this in a very very ge generic way. Uh, was picks to picks, and uh, this came out in November 2016. I know the like date exactly because like the day it came out, I was in the workshop in, in Milan, and I completely changed the entire workshop because because of this. I was like, uh, this is like unreal, because basically because we are, we had been doing things like deep dream and style transfer, but then this was like style transfer except anything to anything else. Um, and so that, of course, is like super exciting. And like within, um, so within like a few months, all of the like you know machine learning artists were were using Pix to Pix. Um, and then there's been lots lots of development on it um, more recently. Now I've already talked about Pix to Pix like in a general sense once or twice um, in previously. But it, for those who don't recall, um, Pix to Pix is basically this repository that lets you train an image to image transformation. Um, using a generative model, which is con which is um, which is basically uh, well, it learns the transformation of any sort as long as you have data for it, right? You don't even have to necessarily explicitly identify what it is that you're doing as long as you have a parallel data set. It will learn that that transformation. So, for example, if you have a data set of places in the daytime and the nighttime, right? Then you can train picks to picks to take one of these, an image in the daytime, and then convert it into its equivalent nighttime image, right? Or vice versa, right? Um, you might have an image, images of sketches of things. So this has been one of the big things that people use a lot. Sketches of objects and photographs of them. So parallel, right? So you can train it to go from sketch to photo or photo to sketch, right? Um, you can do uh, you can you can use it to do colorization, right? So uh, coloring black and white images. You can a, a typical one is is changing label maps into into images into photo into photorealistic images. So for example, like if you have a you know a labeled street view where you know purple is is roads and blue is cars, you can generate the um, you know let's say you're generating a video game graphics or something like that. This would be a really easy way to to do that. Um, so label map to photos, uh, label map to architectural facades. Um, you can go the other way around as well. So right, like taking a photograph and then giving you the equivalent uh, like label map, um, which can be very useful for a lot of things, right? Maps, uh, map applications. So that's um, probably what Google's doing in a lot of places to fill out. Um, or I guess now there's stuff on there. Uh, there is, you know, there's actually a really interesting article about just how much better Google Maps is than yeah. Apple Maps, and it talks a lot about the machine learning stuff that Google Maps that is doing. And it's not, I don't know if they're necessarily doing something like this because they don't, I don't think they really need, well, um, they do so implicitly. So like the, they, that article talked about how um, Google is able to figure out if an area is like very residential or very commercial simply by the, like the, arch, the um, architectural uh, qualities that they get from the sort of the Google Earth view, like the 3D, three dimension, they have all this 3D data. Um, so that that's like really really neat, um, yeah. So with, with pix to pix, uh, is it is it based on the the previous slide, which had the image going in, but also the v vector into generative models? Are you able to adjust the v vector with pix to pix, or could it? Uh, in uh, in theory, you could, yeah. But uh, usually, like it'll be kind of obfuscated for us. Okay. Yeah. Um, now. Uh, okay, so yeah, I, it's, this was, well, I told you I was um, in Milan when Pix Pix came out, I reformatted the workshop and then we ended up making a project using it, 
Um, so this was just in the first couple of days, basically. Like this was this project called Invisible Cities, which I did with some of my students collaboratively. It was really, really neat. You could see that what we did was we downloaded OpenStreetMap tiles, and we trained multiple uh, map to satellite image um, uh, map to satellite image generators, and then threw in different city map tiles into um, into the generative models for other cities, so you could do a sort of city style transfer. So here's Los Angeles as um, in the style of Venice, Milan in the style of Venice, um, Milan in the style of Los Angeles and Venice. Then you could input, then you could just generate your own custom maps, right? And we're going to see more projects that are along these lines uh, that let you kind of like generate some synthetic landscape or portrait or whatever from, uh, a, you know, from a hand drawn or otherwise like interactively formatted, uh, interactively generated label. Um, there's a, you, we're not going to do this right now, but this, this made a big splash, like I think maybe half a year or so after the original Pix to Pix, you could then put it online. Initially, um, this guy Christopher Hess wrote this, uh, wrote it basically as a server client thing. So you had TensorFlow in the server side, you would, you would, on the client side, you would generate a sketch and then send the sketch from the client to the server and then the server was running TensorFlow or whatever and then would generate the, the cat or whatever and then send it back to you. Um, and so that was how it was initially uh, done. But then uh, I guess about a year after that or so, like, all right, well, I don't know what it was, maybe mid 2017, uh, there was a the TensorFlow.js, the JavaScript version of TensorFlow, was uh, they implemented a pix to pix model in TensorFlow.js that you could run on the client side. And then this changed from being from being a server client to you download the model, which can, might be as small as five megabytes. And then um, it can do the edge to cat whatever processing on the client side. And ML5 has, uh, has like really, really easy to follow instructions for generating your, I think, uh, I think it has it, right? It definitely has it for style transfer. Maybe they haven't. It's, it's uh, in a separate repository that's not linked, but it's okay. in the name. Yeah. Well, the point is that you can definitely do this in ML5, like really easily, which is which is great because then you can make like it's so nicely integrated with P5, right? It would be very easy, uh, not very easy, but like very straightforward in the sense of like with the skills that you already have to make your own custom interfaces for generating these. Um, the pix to pix implementation in TensorFlow.js is still kind of small, 256 by 256. Um, that's just the limitations that that we have to live with. Uh, when it comes to the browser, but but it'll, it's always getting bigger, right? It, it took like maybe a, a half a year or a year to see pix to pix on the non-browser side get get as big as 1024 by 1024. So like you'll you'll see that stuff um, progress very quickly. Uh, there's another example of a photo generator. Um, someone uh, oh I have the link wrong. Uh, this yeah this guy Bertrand Gondu Gonduin. Uh, made a Pokemon co colorizer, right? So it's like you draw a Pokemon and it just colors it for you. So there's a, a lot of variations of this, right? Because basically the quickest thing that you can do with Pix2Pix is you can download a data set of the objects that you're interested in and then uh, extract edges from them. And I'll actually show you how to do that with the ML4A ut utils uh, after the break um, so that you can do this with any data set of, of, that you wish. So here's a Pokemon colored Eiffel Tower. So you're saying you train, it, you train it on the edges? You train it from edges to photos, you know, and I, or, or images or whatever, you know, because you can always extract edges from anything, right? Uh, the, the trick is that you have to extract them in a way that you expect will look roughly like what a person would, will draw. And that turns out to be like, uh, can be a little, little difficult, but, but we have ways of doing that and I'll show you. Um, uh, this guy in Yemen made a made a really nice like label to scene uh, street, uh, not see, uh, like a label to painting generator. This is also online. Uh, you can you can actually do this. I think we showed it maybe in the first week, and it's trained on a specific data set, um, the cityscapes data set, which which actually has colored uh, colored labeled images. This is otherwise very difficult to set up if you don't have if you don't actually have a labeled data set, um, semantically labeled anyway. I'll just show you some pix to pix projects and a few of them you've already seen, I think in week one when we introduced the course, but, um, but I'll just show you the ones that, I, again, this is kind of to try to energize you in terms of like starting to think about what sorts of things you might be interested in trying to do because a lot of these are, 
you know, you like I'll show you the art project, but but think about the like more general, uh, like on, at a lower level, like what is the what is this an example of, right? And then and then maybe you can apply your own examples to it. So for example, this project by Anna Riddler, she uh, called uh, Follow the House of Usher. So Follow the House of Usher is a movie by Ed, uh, or a book by Edgar Allan Poe that was turned into um, a movie. And then she actually uh, extracted a few hundred frames from the movie and then generated a pix to pix data set of her redrawing those frames, like, like basically painting them. So that's pretty painstaking. I think, I think it took her like many, many hours to, to create that data set. I don't know how many images she actually made. Uh, but then uh, once you have enough, you can train pix to pix to convert movie frames into your painting style. And so then she regenerated the whole movie as though she painted it. Um, so Pix the Pix can kind of extend your reach, let's say. Um, in, Any ideas how many images? She I or? probably, probably like a few hundred. Yeah. And I, I don't know exactly. Yeah. This is Go, uh, Golan Levin. Golan Levin really loves hands. And so uh, I think, uh, and, and there's a data set that basically has the fingers labeled. And so then you can just make like, you know, like you train, you train it on actual hands and you know, where the fingers are all color coded. And then you can just like, you know, make, uh, make a hand with eight fingers and you know, in all sorts of different positions and then throw that in and, and, uh, and yeah, generate. They look like hearts actually, right? Like with the ventricles. Yeah. Um, this is a really neat thing that Memo did. Uh, basically, um, so he, tr so he, um, so the the canny edge detection thing I I've, I've already made reference to. Canny uh, canny is a way of of extracting edges from uh, images, and so he took like you know lots and lots of, downloaded lots and lots of images of, of the ocean, and then ran them through a canny edge detector and generated a, a training set that contains the photos of the ocean or the beach or whatever, along with the edges extracted, and then he puts you know, something in front of the webcam and extracts the edges from that and then runs it through the, the ocean module. And so then you get, you get stuff like this, right? So he can generate these like, but and then this, this he'll, yeah, he'll put, he'll put like, he'll put his phone charger there and it becomes like a big rock. Right. Uh, he has got other models. So fire. Yeah. Uh, flowers and so on. Yeah, very poetic. Can you do this in real time? Yes, you can do it in real time. Yeah, uh, with a not unlike, let's say, a MacBook, but but um, but you can do it on the computer with a GPU in real time. Mm -hmm. And he has code for doing that actually, and so do I. Um, so then, okay, the first person to do, so then this this was this has been a thing that. Uh, a lot of people have gotten a lot of mileage out of, including myself. I think Mario was the first person to try this. So Mario Klingman trained it on face face extraction, right? So you can get a face tracker to pull out images of people's faces, and then train it to chain to take the landmarks, the face landmarks, and generate a face, right? And so this was synthesized on uh, sorry, this was trained on fifteen hundred images from BL Digital. I think that's. Um, some museum collection or like of, uh, of like old time sketches of people, you know, like 19th century um, portraits. And so it's generating these portraits basically of them. And then he did this thing called alternative face. Who, who saw this? Let's look at this. Um, alternative face, then which is basically- explain, you okay. did not answer the question. Why did the president send out his press secretary, who's not just the spokesperson for Donald Trump, he could be the. He is so also serves as the spokesperson Conway, for all of America at times. He speaks uh, for all Donald of the Trump's country at times. Why put him out there, there the, for the, the very first time in front of that podium comment, right? to Who utter a that? provable that falsehood? Cool. It's a small thing, so then, uh, but the Mario first basically time is he confronts the public, Conway's face landmarks and it's running a through a generative model that generates. Um, Chuck, I mean, if we're going to keep referring to our press secretary in those types of terms, I think that we're going to have to rethink our relationship here. I want to have a great open relationship with our press but look what happened the day before talking about falsehoods we allowed the, the press spray to come <laughs> to press to um, so um, I made myself a personal Trump 
uh, Meat Puppet Face, actually, um, Mario did this also. Mario always does everything first. Uh, but basically, like, um, this was this was the state of the art with Pixtapix, Pix, let's say, in uh, late, no, uh, late 2016, early 2017. Um, more recently, oh, let me just show you this first. I just put this, uh, I just made this today. So now this is using pix to pix HD. So it's, it's improved a lot. You see Paul Ryan's face kind of coming out in the right, like, like randomly. <laughs> um, so this is, so it, the, the state of the art is getting a lot better. Yeah. How many uh, images, I assume this trained on one video. Because yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I pulled out like a thousand frames. Okay. Yeah. Something like that. Um, one of my students in the workshop last year did the same thing for a, um, uh, a video of Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany. So, um, yeah. <laughs> would multiple videos work, or would it just start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would. Back. Then you might then you might start getting like sort of oscillations between contexts. Um, yeah, but it would. Um, there's a blog post, uh, this, this guy, uh, modified picks to picks. So I can, I can tell you how he did this. Like I've also tried this, but I didn't get as good results as him, but he basically modified the original picks to picks to produce 1024 by 1024. All you have to do is, uh, in, um, not that this is, not, I wouldn't necessarily say this is straightforward, but, but I can, I actually, I think I have, I have to remember, but I think I have a fork that, that has this, I think my fork of picks to picks has this. You can basically just add a layer, uh, one one or two layers to the generator and discriminator, and then basically just makes it bigger. Um, they they, I don't know if this is as good to train as I, I had better results just using Pixpix HD, which is like made to be high resolution from the get go. But but the results that this guy got are actually really impressive. So I, I have linked to his blog post um, if in case anyone's interested in trying to get results like that. A friend of mine named Jasper von Lonen out in the Netherlands uh, basically used um, the Google Maps or Google Street View API to download a whole bunch of Street View scenes as well as their corresponding depth maps. So you can extract the depth maps um, from, from Street View and then train Pix to Pix to convert the depth maps into, into Street View scenes. And so then he made his own depth maps inside of Unity or something like that uh, and then generated a video like this. I've been telling him I think that he should do this again with pix to pix HD because you can see this is like a really awesome idea, very much ahead of its time, but it just doesn't look that good because the data is a little bit suspect. Uh, but I think if you were to try this again, it would probably come out a lot better. Um, it's really neat though. Yeah. Yep. Uh, what do you think would happen if uh, instead of using depth maps, you just uh, did a flat rendering with the colors? What do you mean flat rendering? Like uh, just, um, so there's the, the pix to pix uh, algorithm where it was just like the colors that people were drawing in the street view information was rendered. Oh, oh like sure, but I don't think you have, there's no, there's nothing like that in street view. There's just the the street, the photos. There's no labels no, as I far know, as I know. Make up, you could make up a completely new video, but instead it would be rendering, like there would be some three-dimensional information mm -hmm. that you could uh, establish in a 3D modeling environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, out. but how would you train it? Because uh, you need parallel, right? You need the street view, and then it's co it's corresponding, you know, label map. Right. So, so the uh, street view that you can't get a training set like that of any sort for pix to pix at least. So then, what what, what was being used in the, uh, the initial example? In, in this one? No, the initial example you showed. Uh, Which one? Where it was um, it was the object to uh, to image um, conversion. So. Like you paint something red and then. Oh well, that 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 was like the one that Z Zaid made, the guy in yeah. Yemen. So that there actually is a data set called Cityscapes, right. which does have uh, like basically you know street views and labels. So so the, so yeah, that data set has it's like photographs of streets, and then it actually has the corresponding label map. Uh, so Google Street View doesn't have that; it just has the depth map. Um, yeah. So if you want to do something like this, where you have a depth map, you you could do that, yeah, like like what it, it, using that data set, let's say, um, or if you could generate your own, yeah, which is not definitely not trivial. Um, our buddy Chris uh, basically did pix to pix using dense pose, right? Well, so, I'm your host, Stephen Colbert. You know. So here's a you take a clip of of Stephen Colbert, 
Then he ran Welcome Dense Pose on Welcome one and all it. to The Late Show. I'm your host, Stephen Colbert. So Dense Pose gives you, you know. this. It gives you basically like a position of uh, bodies as well as well Thank as you. UV, uh, Thank UV you for your support because uh, for I the need texture. it. You know, uh... And then he trains picks to picks to go from Welcome one and all the, to the, the Late Show. I'm your host, Stephen Colbert. To Colbert. You know. and so then he puts himself in front of the camera, grabs his own Dense Pose, and generates a Colbert mesh. Thank you for your support and so because then he just starts uh, I need it. Like, you know, uh, pantomiming. They say that time Colbert. heals all wounds. And then slowly and Alejandro they comes are in. Wrong. And then time I can think also maybe fester. I don't know. All <laughs> then wounds. Then you gotta start of lopping stuff dance. off before it spreads. I don't know what's going on? Yeah. And I'm beginning to think it's time to reach for the bones. <laughs> Uh, later, this was just a few months ago, vid to vid came out, and so if you just have like 5,000 GPUs lying around, hey. Um, yeah, this one, I actually tried to get this running and I've been having problems with it. It is not an easy repository to, to use, at least not on HPC. But basically this, um, this is like Pix to Pix, uh, except first of all it's HD, uh, it's in high resolution. And, in, and, it, and it explicitly works with videos. So, and, and what I mean by videos is just a sequence of frames, you know. Um, it's, it's really not different in, categorically. It doesn't take in like a video as an input, but it does um, use the, it does take advantage of the fact that you can get information about the same object in neighboring frames from different angles, let's say, to get a lot more of a temporal coherence, right? So, so now you see that it's much smoother and it's generating like pretty nice looking uh, street layouts. Um, so you can imagine like, and it does this fast, right? So you can imagine video game engines of the future are able to generate textures um, using these methods uh, in real time. So, so there's a lot to kind of like, yeah, there's a lot to look forward to this with this tech. They showed um, their face-to-face -face results were just mind-boggling, right? So basically you have here, so like, you know, my version of the Trump meat puppet is easy enough for you to see that it's fake, but how, you know, how long do you have to look at these to notice the same thing, right? So those are trained on images of real, real people, um, but then the actual videos that you're looking at are synthetic based on the, based on the, um, yeah, on the extracted landmarks. It's probably a little bit, um, because they're using the, the same model, let's say, or the same person uh, for getting the test data as well. So maybe like if the person's face is differently shaped, it may, it may not end up looking quite as realistic. So, so you know, there's, it's not ex exactly there. This might be cherry picked results, but it's getting pretty damn realistic, right? So, so just imagine like, okay, uh, it took about one year for style transfer to go from being a paper uh, to being an app on an iPhone, right? It took about a year. So I think one year, maybe because of the complexity, two years, let's say, uh, you'll be able to just like, um, like you take, you, if you have a 15 second long video of your friend, you'll be able to imitate them like convincingly and maybe another app you'll have another app just for telling it telling you whether it's real so <laughs> that's the future um, they also showed the results doing the post to body thing this is kind of like you know what what chris did um, and their results are like you can see they're they're quite a bit better um, in terms of fidelity and then i showed this the first week because uh, this is like just the coolest thing i got in trouble i got like when i posted the video um, I got copyright notices because they're playing like Bruno Mars and, and all that. So I turned off the sound, um, which is unfortunate because it's like, it really like, well, never mind. Like, <laughs> so, okay, you guys saw this, right? Basically, dense po uh, po this is actually like basically PoseNet, right? So you could try to do this with, with, with PoseNet. Um, you can extract from the source video a bunch of poses, train picks to picks to take the PoseNet data and generate the... Um, generate the source video, and then you could put yourself in front of the camera, extract your poses, and then, uh, uh, you know, run it, uh, run it through the, the uh, yeah, run it through the generative model, right? So this is just like outrageous, right? So she can't dance, now she can. I think that it gets more complicated as it goes, yeah. Okay, and then, and then they get more and more difficult, right? So like, that's Bruno Mars. You have and then 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in this case, you have to tra- train the, um, the, the subjects uh, or the tar- or whatever the target is. You have to train the target, yeah. Yeah, so it wouldn't work unless you just hit that person to like move around a bunch and get there, basic. But yeah, you would, yeah, they would like maybe, you know, just random dances just to get right. as many positions as possible. Right. But yeah, something like, something like that. Um, oh yeah, her, <laughs> her friend is the best here. Like, uh, oh. And actually, wait, I just want to show you the last one. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, but even ballet. And this one's the hardest because like there's a lot of drop because the, the dancer's moving so fast that like the, the pose uh, extraction doesn't necessarily work that well. Um, just in case of any, this is an aside, but if anyone is doing stuff with, um, with like, uh, is interested in doing body stuff, Golan Levin just put this, uh, posted one of his lectures called the expanded body, which is just kind of a collection of like the, you know, the history of, you know, graphics and abstraction from in the, in like the new media art world with bodies and dancers and stuff. And this might give you a lot of inspiration, um, and not, not just for picks to picks, but but just generally because there's a lot of really cool stuff in there, um, including the things that you're looking at. So that's that's an aside, but definitely worth checking out. Um, so this is um, this is this online demo. You uh, actually no, they don't the demo. You can't actually use it online, but I, I don't think. Uh, but basically, this is kind of like what Zaid had, right? You have this interactive drawing application. You make a label map, you could draw yourself with the mouse, and then it also lets you, um, right, so you like draw some mountains or trees or whatever. And then it also lets you, it also lets you mess with the attributes, so you can make it more sunny, or you can make it more snowy, right? You can increase or decrease the amount of fog or, or, or uh, yeah, change the seasons, things like that. So th- this kind of stuff is like well on its way to a lot of design software. I would definitely expect this to be in things like Photoshop in the near future. Um, okay, let me show you some cool art experiments and I should have renamed this whole, uh, this like whole class should be like the Mario Klingemann lecture because he, he has, he, I have a lot of slides with his work because he's done a lot of like really cool things to fix the picks. Um, so like I said, he did a lot of face to face stuff, uh, face, uh, face extraction stuff and I think the way that this is being generated this really really weird video of generated faces is that he trained reciprocal pix-to-pix models right so you can train A to B and B to A and then you have both models right you can train it to take an image of a face and give you the face landmarks um, and you can train it to take the Im- uh, images of landmarks and give you a face right uh, maybe you don't in the case of faces maybe you can just use a uh, normal landmark extraction so maybe it's not necessary to do this that way but but that's one way of doing this and then basically okay you have you'll make a random face face landmarks generate the face that becomes the first frame then maybe um you either distort it and then and then run that through the b to a model that'll give you the face landmarks that are distorted and then take that and then run it again through a to b right so you do this sort of ping-ponging you go A to B, B to A, A to B, B to A, and then and then save all of the Bs, um, and and because you're doing this ping ponging, you have the ability to kind of make distortions or modifications to what you receive in between. That lets you me- get, I think, get effects like this. Now, uh, now he doesn't have code for this online, so I don't know exactly the method that he's using, but along those lines. And there's like a lot of room for exploration with this technique, um, doing that kind of stuff. Um, that's so he's that also the basis for his installation called Uncanny Mirror. So that's actually a video that I took. Does that look like me? It's like <laughs> baby face gene. Um, basically, the way Uncanny Mirror works is that it's uh, the mirror. Okay, so it's it's doing this sort of takes your landmarks and then it's generated to um, generated to make a face from that. But it also, uh, what, it's, what it does is that it's recording people when they come in front of the mirror. And then whenever no one's in front of the mirror, it, it keeps a running buffer of the last 1,000 images. And then, it, and then it retrains the model. It fine-tunes the model to whatever images it just captured. 
So basically, you end up having um, you uh, you're you're looking at what it you know the most recent. It's like you looking like the person who stood in front of the mirror before you, um, in in principle. So it's pretty yeah, it's pretty neat. Mario also did. Uh, I think was the first person to do this next frame prediction. So here's a really clever thing to do with pix to pix You take any source video, you extract all the frames, and then you train pix to pix to go from frame one to frame two, frame two to frame three, frame three to frame four, and so on, right? So you have pairs, which are consecutive frames, and then your pix to pix model, you can just run it as a feedback loop. So you generate, in, you generate an image, and then you make that the input to the next round and generate the next image, right? And this, I tried to do this for like Super Mario levels and it didn't work because okay. it explodes. It, it can definitely like, it can generate and then, and then find some like, like spiral out of equilibrium basically. Like, like the trick is to get it into some sort of an equilibrium state where, where it's always generating something that's, that can plausibly be an input. So things like fireworks and fluids and, and fire and, you know, kind of naturalistic things like that work pretty well. Um, it worked really well for him to, to do it on, on fireworks. Um, I think, uh, so the, this guy at, at Google um, named uh, Damien Henry, who's at the Culture Lab in Paris, he did, I think, roughly the same thing, um, generated this video where the, he took a video from out of the window of a train and then just perpetually generated, um, yeah, just perpetually generated, like, you know, train, train view windows. It's really cool, um, I think. This is just from a, like a week ago. This is crazy. And I, I'm, if for any of you who are interested in Unity, you, uh, for any of you who use Unity, like he has software for doing this in Unity. So this is a, um, this guy, uh, Keijiro Takahashi in Japan, I guess. And he has a pix to pix next frame prediction uh, for Unity um, that you can control with a MIDI controller. And so it looks really awesome. Like, uh, and so... Um, I, I didn't look too carefully at this, but but I think that's basically what it's doing. Pix to pix next frame prediction, and it works inside of Unity. Um, so uh, I think he has some libraries like uh, putting pix to pix inside of Unity. So that's that's really good. how many people here use Unity? Okay, like quite quite a few of you. So that might be that might be of use of interest to you. Um, okay, so like uh, <laughs> let's just really quickly put this on. Like Mario made all these music videos. So you can also like do, okay, like um, train multiple face models and then do some uh, extraction of features from the audio and use those to, you know, oscillate between models. It's really cool, right? Anyway. Um, okay, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, a preview of something that I'm working on. So, like, I'm actually making a, a big installation for a an upcoming uh, museum in Berlin named Futurium. So, for anyone who's gonna be in Berlin next summer, this is gonna be the coolest thing for you to check out. I hope I'm like working on it right now. So, uh, and this is and this is a very very general case of picks to picks. So, I think this might be of of use to you. You're basically looking at the proposal I sent them. So, here's the idea. Collect lots and lots of paintings from wiki arts, right? So you can scrape these, and then we have the wiki art scraper. So you get all these landscapes, right? And then extract edges from them, right? You can see the correspondence. You do some canny edge detection. I need to improve this, right? Because I don't like all of these like little little lines. So the goal is to try to get it to look as closely to what people would draw on the screen, right? So then there's too many, you know, it's it's a little too digital. It's not very natural. So I'm gonna try to change that basically but that's what I have right now okay same thing and then basically train pix to pix to convert the sketches to the landscapes right and then basically you'll have a touch screen in front of the monitor and you you touch screen in front of the monitor that generates the landscapes I, I don't actually have a, an example here uh, but but that's going to be the basic idea and then similarly the invisible cities thing that I showed you that goes from map to satellite image so the idea is do this in Berlin, generate a label map to a city, uh, city view uh, type thing, basically, 
And then um, what I have is basically I'll have like a sort of like a little playpen with a bunch of laser cut pieces. Red is buildings, blue is water, green is park. I'll have a camera on top of it. And then the camera is extracting those and generating the label map, sending them to pix to pix and then pix to pix grabs it back and then gives you the satellite image, right? Um, so, so that's going to be the basic idea. I'm showing this because like, um, like this is the sort of thing that I imagine like a lot of people would be interested in here, like making something similar, like making interactive play pens of this sort, I think is very much like in the wheelhouse of a lot of people here. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's the basic idea. So you can get a lot of mileage out of this sketch to photo idea, um, which, which, um, which yeah, makes things really, really neat. Uh, yeah, that'll be there. Okay, so let's just see how we're doing in time. So it's one twenty. What time did we start? Twelve ten, and we have until. Let's do this. Let's take a break now, and then uh, when we come back, we'll uh, introduce cycle again, and I'll give you some tutorials. Yeah. Okay. Quick break. So now let's get into unpaired image translation. So all of the examples that I've shown you so far are trained on data sets where you have paired images, right? So for example, like with these shoes, you have, you have that shoe and you have its corresponding outline. Um, and you know, if you have, if you're training a face generator, you have a face and its corresponding face landmarks, right? So that's paired image translation. Now there's a lot of cases of image translation in which getting paired images is very difficult, if not impossible. Um, so like, for example, if you want to generate some sort of a style transfer photo to photo to, you know, style transfer type thing, well, you may not already have paintings and photographs of the same place um, at a certain time, right? So like you, um, and, and okay, like, let me show you, for example, so this is, this was cycle again, right? And in cycle again, one of the example cases that they use is this zebra to horse translation, right? Now, just imagine how difficult it would be to set, to make pix to pix do that, right? You would have to get pictures of zebras and horses in the same position, um, which is not not at all easy to do. Um, of course, like summer to winter, winter to summer, you'd have to take pictures of, of uh, pictures of places six months apart. So obviously, like um, it would be desirable to have some sort of an image translation. Uh, that does not re have the requirement that you um, th that that the images are paired, right? So, um, and that's what CycleGAN was. I, th I guess the first, probably the first example of this to do. So it's basically like Pix to Pix, except unpaired image translation. You have one folder of horses and one folder of zebras, and you can do horse to zebra, um, you know, horse to zebra conversion. Um, so, like for example, Monet to photo, right? So this takes paintings by Monet and converts them into, obviously this doesn't look like an exact photograph, but it's more photograph-like than, um, than the original painting, right? So that's kind of cool, like trying to turn paintings into photographs. Um, they, there's all sorts of really cool app, uh, applications of Cycle again. I'm gonna show you some of them from the original paper. So this is basically uh, photo enhancement. So it creates fake depth of field. Right, you see that it, it, it blurs the images. Um, okay, you have apples to oranges, oranges to apples. Um, you have winter to summer, summer to winter. Um, they have this example of basically taking cityscapes, the cityscapes data set, and re-rendering it as though it looks like Grand Theft Auto. That's pretty cool, right? So you just all, and what do you do? You just extract tons and tons of frames uh, from Grand Theft Auto and uh, and throw them into cycle again along with the cityscapes and then you get you know Grand Theft Auto in the style of cityscapes or vice versa um, they showed this horse being turned into a zebra in real time it's just outrageous right and of course like um, you notice that the, that the grass becomes like a savanna you know so there's a little bit of sampling bias kind of creeping in of course the um, cycle again does not uh, is not perfect uh, it does make some mistakes sometimes adjacent to the to target, um, turning turning uh, heads of state into supervillains. Um, so I'll just show you some some work by other people who have been using CycleGAN a lot. Um, so Helena, who's going to be here, uh, I mentioned her earlier. 
she started working on the cycle again shortly after the the paper and kind of generated these basically like made, took lots of her own paintings and then made cycle again convert images of like fruits and vegetables into her painting style so you get this sort of um you get this kind of a setup this is done at one of my workshops just a few weeks ago i think did i show this so basically so one of my students at, at uh, ecal in lausanne i had a workshop there a few weeks ago and basically what he did was he trained cycle again to convert maps into sort of like like a google uh, or open street maps into old style maps he downloaded like a whole bunch of like you know ar archaic maps of different places from the let's say 18th 19th century and then he set up the browser he made a browser extension that would download all the tiles of the map send them to cycle again and then cycle again would convert them into the map and then send them back to the browser it's a really really hardcore engineering project uh, probably a little too much engineering for my taste but it did create like a really cool app and he open sourced it it's called deep maps so for anyone who's kind of interested in working with this uh, it's definitely there for you and again like like just think about it this way like maybe you're not interested try to think lower level right maybe you're not interested in this precise uh, transformation but you might be interested in the idea of a browser and cycle again interaction right maybe there's other things that you can intercept in the browser and have them converted into uh, into map tiles, or sorry, not into map tiles, but into something, into something else, right? And um, and so for so this might uh, this, for example, might do a lot of the. It's a Firefox extension, actually, I think, uh, and um, it it should do a lot of the heavy lifting for you if you're interested in that. Um, so this is some other stuff like it's really so yeah, face to ramen. So this turns people's faces into ramen and ramen into faces. And uh, yeah, so if you ever wanted to know what you look like as ramen, um, this is a way to do that. The nice thing about this is that like, as I, I was putting these slides together yesterday and, and just looking online, like searching Google and Twitter for, for pics to pics and cycle again. And there's all this stuff that I completely missed because there was just a tor like again like a torrent of I, I feel like in the early days like I knew every time someone made something and now it's like it's just not possible to keep track of it anymore uh, this is really cool so this is the electronic curator so they basically trained it to go faces to fruits and vegetables right so let's look at this Someone goes in front of the camera and they see themselves as, as like a plate of fruit. Most people believe that a computer can generate a portrait, but it cannot tell how good this portrait is. The Electronic Curator is a project that deals with curatorship and with decision making. Right. Really, really neat. Uh, cats to dogs, and back, to, back again. Um, normally, CycleGAN actually doesn't really work that well for this um, because it doesn't do so well at sort of like um, shape transfer. It does; it's really good for for texture transfer, but but I don't know how it is that they got they got some really nice results um, with cats to dogs. Country as a piggy bank to rebuild China, and many other countries are doing the same thing. So we're losing our good jobs. So many of them. When you look at what's happening in Mexico, a friend of mine who builds plants said it's the eighth wonder of the world. They're building some of the biggest plants anywhere in the world, some of the most... Left without comment. Um, yeah. This is from just like a... a oh. Plus a follow. That's, I copied and pasted this from Vimeo. Anyway, like, check this out. This is basically um, neural rendering with CycleGAN. So timber... So on the left, that's that's his 3D model, and on the right, in in real time, it's sending the cycle again frames in in Grasshopper, and they're retextured as timber. So and he has a few examples of this. I think he has like a sketch sketch one as well. Food to image translation, so everything becomes curry. <laughs> everything from to fried rice. A lot of these projects are like for I can't even identify them. They're like just random GitHub or random Reddit Reddit posts. Like um, it's just coming from nowhere. 
this is really cool. Uh, I haven't seen exactly how this works, but someone applied CycleGAM to to MIDI. So you know, you don't necessarily have to interpret images so literally. You could actually like think of MIDI as basically a two D grid of pixels, and so they did symbolic music genre transfer, right? And and I don't I don't know if there's any samples if they have in the GitHub, um, but basically like, do they have samples? Ah, yeah. Let's listen to them. Okay, so scenes from childhood, Schumann, classic to jazz. So this turn, oh, let's, okay, let it be pop to classic. So this turns let it be into classic. Do you see anything else that looks good? Famous songs, beautiful playlist. Miles Davis, classic to jazz. Oh, let's hear the Claire de Lune jazz. successful that one is. Uh, I don't know. Anyone see any? So what? Miles Davis? <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Anyway. Um, okay, so there's different, uh, there's different like related to cycle again. There's uh, disco again, which is discover cross domain relations. So this turns handbags into their equivalent shoes. So this does a pretty decent shape transfer. I think cycle again kind of struggles to do this. Um, and I, and I, there is um, there are implementations for this on GitHub if you search for disco again. So okay, you get like you turn a handbag into a shoe. Um, they turn they do g uh, uh, gender changing. So look at this. This is images of, of women uh, and turned into their into their male counterparts, right? Look at look at Ben Stiller, I think. <laughs> as a woman. <laughs> yeah. So um, info again, I mentioned that this doesn't this doesn't take an input as an image, so this is a little bit out of place. I should probably have it earlier. But this is just con uh, actually so this this actually isn't conditional at all. It doesn't it, it just has um, it just has Z basically, but it actually imposes certain constraints in training that give each element in Z, of Z uh, uh, basically like um, some sort of a particular feature that it's responsible for, so like rotation or pose or whatever. Um, this is cool. I, I just discovered this today, so I can't I can't actually um, say very much about it. I don't know. Uh, but basically, this is like multimodal picks to picks. I think it is picks to picks. It's it takes pairs of samples. But then what it does is it generates multiple kinds uh, or like multiple versions. So it's not just like, okay, like this is night to day, but there's three sort of three styles to it. So you can get these multimodal results. And then this is also like a sort of cycle GAN, disco GAN type transfer. So uh, called recycle GAN, so unsupervised video retargeting. So again, like you get a whole bunch of images of of John Stewart, a whole bunch of images of of Colbert and uh, or uh, John Oliver and Colbert, and then you can turn Oliver into Colbert, or vice versa, turn flowers into each other, um, which is pretty cool. And it does pretty decently with sh with shape uh, transfer. I do think they have the source code online, but I'm not 100 percent sure. So this is probably worth you know if you want to do experiment with like sort of face swapping, this might be your best bet. Um, this is really cool. So Mario. This is actually not picks to picks. It's, it's using DG, DGNs. I showed DGNs last week. That's the one that kind of like uses kind of this hybrid of a generative model with the sort of deep dream activation maximization technique. And um, so he conditions those uh, Z vectors on, on music. So this is. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. 
What's your post on line without getting in trouble with Daft Punk? Um, yeah? Uh, just, I'm still not 100% on what uh, it means to condition a uh, So, uh, well, okay, so like you can condition it on, on input images yeah. or condition it on labels, mainly that, right? Okay, so yeah. Like training it with a, uh, like an A and a B? Uh, so that's, yes, sure. That's conditioning on Im input images. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, a few other sort of um, mode to mode, let's say, neural networks. So, so we've kind of, we're done with, um, we're done with pix to pix and cycle again. I want to really quickly mention like a few other tools that might be available for you that are kind of useful and are also, are also in some sense, um, you know, um, conditional generative model. Uh, that, well, okay, so these aren't generative models. This YOLO is not a generative model because it's just doing uh, object detection. So this is a little bit out of place, but we didn't get to it in, in any of the previous lectures, so I wanted to include it here. I tried to set up YOLO uh, on this computer. Like I, I was able to get it working on my Mac a while ago, but for some reason I'm having uh, memory issues when I try to run it here. I have it all set up, but see at the last second when, I, when it gets, yeah, it runs out of memory. So this doesn't work, but you can try to, if you, for those of you who have reasonably new uh, um, MacBooks that have NVIDIA GPUs, um, actually, technically, you don't even have to build this with CUDA enabled. You might be able to get this working on your computer and running running object detection in real time. Um, it's 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 pretty nice, and then we can actually really quickly like look at it um, because so first of all, this repository is made by a madman. So like Joseph Redman, like his commit log is just full of like random inside jokes and 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 emojis and stuff. It's completely inscrutable. It's like impossible to understand like any of what he's doing. <laughs> this guy is absolutely a madman. It, the, the whole, the, the, the repository is called Darknet. So like this is all always, uh, the licenses of course, very humorous. Provided all caps so that you know it's important. Don't email me about it. That's basically the license. Like do whatever you want, stop bothering me. Like I tried to bother him and he didn't, didn't care. So. <laughs> Um, I just want to like not to keep like look at he made his own logo for the library. It's like this really cryptic logo. We can look at Joseph Redman's resume. Uh, this is this is what you get to be if you're a researcher. You can be completely irreverent because like you know people just want your powers, and so you can just you know Joseph is my hero basically. Like I, <laughs> if you're out there, Joseph, you're my hero. Anyway. Um, YOLO is really awesome. So it does, um, so uh, uh, single forward pass object detection. So dog, bicycle, truck. Um, actually, we can we can look at the, uh, the. It comes with the. Where is it? So if we look at the YOLO, you can see how well it works. So pretty fast object section. Um, uh, okay, so yeah, de dense cap. I'm gonna show you how to use this. So this does, basically, it's kind of like YOLO, except this in, in, in a sense is a generative model because it's generating sentences from images and it's generating them on, on sort of bounding boxes of things. Okay, right, so you have a cup of coffee and you have a glass of water with ice and lemon, right? So you can do, you can generate sentences about images. Right, and and you saw this already with like if you if um, Chris probably showed you this on runway, the I am to text module, which takes an image and gives you a sentence about the image. This is the same thing except it gives you multiple sentences about parts of the image, um, and we can and the software is actually quite easy to use. We can show it. I did this uh, like applied it to Deep Dream video just as a joke, right? So like Deep Dream of course with all the dogs everywhere. So a brown dog, a dog standing on a table. Um, but then my favorite thing is, okay, wait, when it gets, there's, there's a school bus, the bus is yellow. Yeah, that's my favorite. So finally I did something without a bus. You can use GANs to do video prediction. 
So this will generate frames of, of, of images like predict the future and make some really gnarly looking babies. Um, okay, text to image is another. So we, we've seen this already like, okay, generate an image from a sentence. So you have sentence to image. You, you have image to sentence and sentence to image. And so if you have image to sentence and sentence to image, then you have the opportunity to create feedback loops, right? So here's a work by uh, Jake Elwes, also took a workshop with me a couple of years ago. And he made this thing that basically takes the DGN, the, this is DGNs, I think, and basically um, gives you a caption from it. Fly, uh, sky is blue and clear. Then takes the caption and tries to generate the image. The sky is blue and clear. Then get a caption from that. Basically, it's just ping-ponging, right? Generate the image, generate the text, and go back and forth. Yeah. Um, StackN is another version of text to, text to image synthesis. This bird is white, black, and brown in color with a brown beak. That's a generative, um, generative, generated image. And it's really neat because, uh, well, this is actually older now than attention again. So th this is actually like a more up-to-date version of, of uh, text to image. So it's probably better to look at this. Um, but StackN is also kind of there. Um, yeah, it has its own nice like latent space that you can play with. Okay, so we're at the end of the slides, and I'm gonna, going to now show you a couple of, well, we're doing pretty decently on time. Um, we end at 3.05, right? Is that right? Something like 3.05? Um, or 3.10? I can't remember. Any case, um, we're going to now, okay, so uh, I wanna quickly, okay, here's, here's what we'll do actually. This is the, the plan. I wanna show you a few things that you can do with dataset utils. I'm gonna do this on a fresh paper space instance. So we do we set all of that up from scratch. Um, uh, so that like, for those of you, I, I know some people have struggled like getting data set utils to work on their own machines. Um, now there's kind of two things I can say about that. One is that the reason why we're using paper space is because I know like it's, a, it's, it's standardized for everyone. Um, unfortunately, I can't debug everyone's computer. That is like impossible. That's the whole thing with paper space. You can get it working on your computer, but you're a bit on your own um, for that. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I can help, of course, to like a, a degree. But then, if, but but then, it's beyond the scope of the class to help people like with with Python stuff. Uh, I want to do. I do want to show you though uh, how to do this from scratch on on paper space because then that's easy. Um, and I, I've actually created a new script um, that will that should make it as easy and painless as possible. So I'll show you some things that you can do with data set utils for generating picks to picks uh, type data sets. And um, then we're going to look at how to use picks to picks and cycle again. And maybe picks to picks HD, yeah, we should, we'll definitely look at this. I'm also gonna show you how to install DenseCap. Um, DenseCap is also really nice to show. And I wanted to show you YOLO, but, but again, like I'm not, for some reason I can't get it running. Um, so we'll see if we can get into that. Um, okay, if you do, this is how you can set up uh, M, the uh, utils down here at the bottom, install ML4A guides. Those commands right there will set, uh, set up ML4A guides on a fresh uh, paper space M, um, ML in the box template and data set utils will work perfectly from this, I believe. So let's actually, let's actually do a test. So I have an, I have one machine here working. We're going to use it. We're going to go through the VM this time instead of instead of gradient. Um, so let me let me quickly like I'm going to make a new machine. I'm going to go to the public templates. and I'm going to uh, take ML in the box 1604. You could probably do this with the Volta as well. The Volta is mo much more expensive, but it's much more powerful also. So so that might be worth looking into if you're trying to train one of the crazy ones. So ML in the box. Um, 51 cents an hour, and we'll we'll give it a name. Um, let's call this like a, an ITP Neuro Aesthetic 7. And I'm gonna give it a public IP, and this is gonna set up a fresh machine. Do you use the, um, the auto snapshot feature? Um, not really. Uh, I usually do like to make my own, uh, I like to make my own templates here and there. So if you, once you have a machine that you like, that has all your data and all your code and all your software set up, all your libraries, 
you can create a template from it. Uh, you, you can't just, it, it's a little uh, confusing because you can't just click new template. They have, um, they have like a paper space makeup template. They have a, you just have to do like one thing first and they tell you exactly what to do. So you basically go into the terminal and you have to run this bash script and then shut down the machine and then create a template. And then once you do that, the template will be available for you forever. So you can you can destroy your machines, you can get rid of them, and then you can spin them up later and have a carbon copy. Everything. It's just a fro. It's like a hard drive a copy of the hard disk. So um, and if you forget to run this script and make a template, that t a machine like it's like it's stupid. They, they they need to fix this. But like basically like. Uh, it won't tell you why. It'll just it won't spin up. It'll just like be provisioning forever. It, this is super confusing the first time I encountered it. So, if you notice that, that's what's happening. Um, but okay. the templates are really just a, a way to make sure that you don't always have a. You're not always using a machine. Like it's a way to save money potentially. Or? It's a few things. Like uh, okay, like if you make a template, you can kill the machine and then not be you know just like so you don't want to keep reinstalling stuff. So you keep the same machine forever. Like, and it's not, it's, it's, it doesn't cost you money except per month. Like it costs you per month money to have it, um, not per, not hourly as long as it's off, as long as it's off. Um, but that's kind of annoying. Like if you're not going to use it for six months, you'd rather just kill it. And then, and then the template, the template also costs a little bit of money, um, to keep it, uh, but not as much as a machine. I think it's like some, a dollar a month or something. Is there an advantage to that versus like turning it off when you're not using it? It saves you money. So I'm paying you when it's off? Yeah, okay. per month. Okay. Per month, yeah. So it's like for, storage. for storage. Similar, yeah, yeah, seven bucks actually. Yeah, right. Uh, the, uh, the IP you can always get rid of, like you can, um, but, but then the, the other thing is, uh, sometimes you want to create multiple copies of the same machine because maybe you have something running in parallel. So there's all sorts of reasons to have a template. Um, so, the, and, and you know, other platforms, Google and Amazon, they have, you know, they have similar things going on. Anyway, just remember to run this script if you make a template. Uh, so this should be, let's see here. Um, okay, and I should have three machines now, actually. Oh, come on, guys. There we go. Okay, this thing is a new machine right there. So let me go into the into here, and I received an email with my new password. And so let me just pull that up, and I'm going to open a terminal. Okay, so here's what I'll do. I'll go into here, and we're going to SSH paper space at public IP. Authenticity can't be established, sure. Password is, it gave me the password, I'm gonna just read it from my email, um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now I'm just gonna change the password. You could do that with pseudo password, paper space, and then Okay, cool. So now, okay, so basically what I want to do is um, work with uh, the ML4A guides. And I guess uh, I don't, we can do this through the terminal, just through the terminal if we want. Um, there's actually not really any pressing need to, to go through the, uh, to make a Jupyter Lab instance. So I'm just going to use this terminal right now. So of course we're in a fresh instance, it just has all this stuff. I'm going to Take ML for a guides and clone them. Git clone ML for a guides, and I'm just going by what the what I have here. So basically, you clone the guides, you go into there, into into the guides, and then you run pip install requirements that text, and that'll give you all of the libraries that, that you don't already have. Um, so basically, I'm going to go cd ML for a guides pip install dash r for recursive requirements that text dash dash user. This will take a couple minutes maybe. 
but it should basically install everything that you need to run the utils. While it is installing, I'm going to also launch Cyberduck and I want to upload something. Um, uh, yes, so don't check. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, okay, I'm gonna, not this one, I'm gonna duplicate this actually. And so papers, this is the way that you can log into your paper space. I gotta grab the IP, public IP. You can you can set it up on paper, on, so it has to be uh, SH, SSH FTP, right? So SFTP, um, papers, you can give it a name or whatever. So let's just call it paper space ITP07. And then you have to put in the server and then paper space is your username. Okay, so there it is. Now I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna, Click on this. I'm gonna send myself also something. Uh, sometimes this thing can get a little screwy. So I'm gonna, Cyberduck is not necessarily the best way to do this, but, but it's good enough for us. Okay, yes. There we go. Password. Okay, now what I want to do is, uh, first of all, I want to send myself something from AirDrop. I'm going to send myself a video. I want to show you how to extract face landmarks. Uh, so I'm going to throw this over here. Accept. So I basically just downloaded this uh, video of myself. Uh, oops. What? what is this? Open with quick time. So I took this video like the other day. This is basically the thing that I used for Trump. So I'm going to actually put this into ML for a guides utils. I'm going to send this over here. And also I'm also going to send a picture of myself and I'll, I'll tell you why in, in just a moment. Um, okay. Accept. I'm also going to upload that. Okay, so that's there. So now they're inside of there, and hopefully this is, uh, it's still installing. So Dlib takes, Dlib takes the longest time to install actually. So this will take still another minute. Um, while it is, oh, it looks like, okay, so it, now it's done. Okay, good, good timing. So now we'll go into utils, and notice that I, I have these movies here, the movie there, and this image of me. So first of all, let's test if Python dataset utils now works. If it does, uh, it should, uh, yeah, everything should kind of import fine and it looks like everything is importing fine. Oh, there's also one other thing that I need to do, which is download these, uh, it, it's written here, but basically if you go into utils in GitHub, we need the face landmarks file so I mean you can download it from there um, so I'm just gonna do that now as well and we also need to th this was actually already inside of the setup so we don't need to install a tensor pack again but we need to grab this model so I'm going to download it I'm gonna grab I'm gonna copy that and then from here let's download it I just ran the command exactly just like that edge, edge it, it does a holistic edge what's called holistic edge detection I'm also going to download uh, the landmarks, uh, dlib landmarks. So that's going to put those inside of data. That'll take a second. And then we have to unzip it as well. Oops. Which you can do this way. So once that's done, then we should be ready to go. Okay. Unzip, and now that should be, yeah, that'll take a second. 
Okay, good. Now we'll run. Now we have everything we need, and we can run uh, this. So what I want to do is I want to show you a few things that you can do with Dataset Utils that will be useful for you for doing pix-to-pix -pix stuff. Um, the first thing I'm going to show you is how to take a video of of some of a face, let's say. Right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take this. Uh, I'm gonna I basically want to extract a whole bunch of uniformly sized images of my face with the face tracker data, right? From this video. And uh, the reason why I also give it another image of me is that this has the option of giving it a source uh, face image. So that like, let's say you have a video that has multiple faces and you're only interested in tracking one of them you can actually give it a face and there's a face recognition module that will allow it to identify whichever face that you're actually trying to extract. So this is what I did for the Trump video. The Trump video, I have him in there and I also have, um, uh, what's their faces? Um, Pence and, uh, who's the other asshole? Uh, Rand, Rand or whatever, you know, who cares? Like, um, basically, uh, and then I'm just pulling out Trump, right? Uh, like and so I'm using the uh, source image. I have an image of Trump to uh, d identify which one because uh, otherwise Dlib will give you like sort of random orderings for for the face markers. So so basically, let's look at these arguments. And actually, I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger. So I'm going to now do this Python dataset utils. And then the first thing we need to do is set input source. Input source can either be a directory of images or a movie file. So I'm going to give it a uh, path to the movie, which is in the same directory. So that's just gene, uh, what is it? gene2.mp4. And then, and then I'm going to now grab, we'll say, okay, max number of images. Like, let's just do 100 images for now. Max number of images says cap it at 100 images. Let us also shuffle it. So if you do shuffle, it'll take random images from the whole video. If you don't have shuffle, it'll take the first hundred, like the first hundred frames. So let's shuffle it so I get a bunch of them. And then I will do uh, this. You can leave if you want to make a minimum, like don't allow any images less than this particular size. This doesn't matter if you're using a video because they're all the same size. Um, then I want to put it into output there so we're going to make a new folder called gene face yeah gene face and then i'm going to do okay what width and height do i want let's do 256 by 256 dash dash w um 256 dash dash h 256 and then you can this will if you want to do augmentation so get multiple copies of the same image with random distur uh, disturbances like you know stretching or rotating or whatever, um, you can do like frac and frac vary. So that will make like how many images to copy. Frac will say okay, crop it to this percentage of the original dimensions of the image and in random crops. Yeah. Just a quick question about uh, reading through this help doc. When it says frac vary and then frac vary in cap, does that mean if we want to use one of those, we have to? Specify factory, factory. It's like it's like the way I'm doing dash dash max num images one hundred. So it's like max images. So factory also takes a number. As, as it takes a number, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, ro rotation stretching, we don't need this, right? So and I want to do centered. So I'll do centered. So that means instead of a random crop, it'll do the cent it'll little little uh, center crop it. And then, okay, and then uh, let's, I'll get to the action in a second, but basically, okay, target face image. So this is, what is the image of the face that you're targeting? So that will be target face image. That's going to be that gene227.jpg. And then also, um, we, okay, this will provide it the, those files. If you put them in the default locations there, you don't have to, you don't have to change that. Um, and then, okay, this dash dash face crop. Okay, what does this mean? So basically, this is what fraction of the output image do I want the face to take up? 
So if it's 1.0, it's going to crop it right around the face, like a perfect box. Like it won't even capture your chin. It'll be like up to your mouth, basically. If you do like, let's say 0 0.7, you know, then it'll be like 70%, right? So let's do 0 0.7, that's fine. Um, okay, now action is extract the face. So there, there, these are the actions that we can do. I'm going to show you a few of these in, in uh, today, but let's let me quickly show you. You have to choose at least one. Uh, okay, if you do if you do none, that means it won't it won't do any distortions to the image. It'll just crop it and then save it as it is, right? But what I want to do is I want to also get the face markers. So I'm going to do action face. Uh, and also, and then the last thing I want to specify is, I forgot to go here, save mode. Okay, what is save mode? So there's three options for save mode. Split combined output only. Split means you'll have one folder with the input image, one folder with the output image. The input image will be like post, post cropping and everything. It'll be the 256 image of the face. And then the output image will be the the face landmarks, right? Um, or maybe it'll go the other way around, I forgot. Uh, but basically split will put them into two separate folders. Combined will actually concatenate them together. So if you notice, if you've already seen pix to pix pix to pix the original repository, like it just takes in the images concatenated together into a single image. And then it, it, then it, and then it actually splits them later. It's just the way it likes it. Um, so I'm because we're gonna use um, we're yeah. We're, let's let's do this with combined. So we'll do this for picks to picks. So I'm going to do save mode combined. If you do save mode output only, then it won't save the cropped image. It'll just take the face landmarks. But we want both of them. Um, so okay. So that should be enough. I think. Uh, okay. So let's try to run this. Okay. It imports a bunch of stuff, including TensorFlow. Um, it actually isn't using TensorFlow here, but it's importing it anyway. And it should, yes. Okay, so it's going to go 100 images. And we can go into Cyberdoc and actually check it out. So it made the new folder here, gene face. And there's our frames. Right? So easy. Super easy to generate these, right? And I made a hundred of them, not so many, but 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 enough. Okay, so um, let's do this. I also want to. Um, okay, we can either we can either show pix to pix now, or maybe I'll let me do a couple more things with dataset utils, and then we'll move on to pix to pix. Quick question. Yeah. Um, you added the shuffle flag. Yeah. And I noticed you did that last week with images. Is mm -hmm. that Um, I, I just didn't want to take the first so if you don't shuffle yeah. then it'll take for a video okay. it'll take the first n frames of the video which will just be like two seconds right so it'll be mostly the same image right because 30 frames per second so there's not a mu so much that's movement. really to apply for video only but if you have or just looking no it just it, all it all it does is it shuffles the if your inputs are have some sort of an order and you want to shuffle them then then you know if you don't have any reason to use it then don't worry about it like you'll know when you need to use it. Yeah, I guess like, as I'm trying to figure out like if the, where a use case for um, working with the data set of images. To, to not shuffle or to shuffle? To shuffle. It's, I, I just want random images from the video. Like so they're as different from each other as possible. Okay, so you want you shuffle. Like you're, you're, you're showing us an example with a video, but what if I'm not using video data utils? What if I'm using a folder image? Then it'll then it'll shuffle those as well. Like instead of going from you know image one to image two, like alphabetical order. And will that impact the training? Um, well, it'll give you different images, right? So if you have a thousand images in the folder, but you only take a hundred, do you want the first hundred or do you want the random hundred? Okay. Right. So that's that's just the utility. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so. Okay, so that's that's done. Now, what I want to quickly do is show you. Let's use the wiki art scraper really quickly. Um, I think I might have confused some people. Um, so, like, let's look at wiki art <coughs> scrape. Um, so basically, 
I think I didn't mention this last time, and, and it seems uh, uh, people made this mistake. You can't do both genre and style. It's one or the other. It will it, like what it should do. It I should set it up so that it does their intersection, but I just don't have that right now. So for now, it doesn't just pick one. Uh, but let's let's download some. Let's do this Python scrape wiki art, and I want to download some. Um, how about like uh, I don't know graffiti. Let's do graffiti. I think that'll be kind of neat. So I'm gonna do genre graffiti. And then also do num pages, let's say like you know, ten pages. Actually let's do twenty pages. Yeah. And then output there. I'm gonna go wiki art graffiti. Okay? So this will download twenty pages worth of graffiti images. And they will be completely like randomly sized and everything. Um, and, oh, oh, oops. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Num pay, output there should just be. It'll make it'll. It, it should be wherever the root directory is. Yeah. So that's that was okay. So it should be just here. If you want to put it somewhere else, you can do that too. Uh, but it has to be a folder that actually exists. Okay. So now it's going to download. 273 images, so not too bad. Um, and while it's doing that, I'm going to actually spin up another separate SSH so that we can do things, multiple things at the same time. Public IP here. And what I'm going to do is I want to set up pix to pix uh, and cycle again. So this is the one that I want to use. I want to use the, the PyTorch implementation that has both pix to pix and cycle again in the same place. So that's actually this repository right here, uh, made by the original authors, in fact. So this has instructions on how to set it up. Basically, we need all these. We already have them. Clone this repo, CD into it, and then we'll have to install some requirements. So I'm going to do that right now. And we're going to install the requirements. OK, so that's while that's doing, I'll come back to here. We downloaded a whole bunch of images. Let's see them. Graffiti. So here's our images of graffiti. Okay, so here's what I want to do. I want to quickly show you how to extract some interesting features from these and generate some pix to pix data sets. So we have, this we have this graffiti here. So again, let's grab the data set utils and get some help on them. And I'm going to now, um, Oh yeah, dash dash help. So this will just give us the, there we go. So we'll do data set utils. And now our input source is going to be graffiti. So the folder graffiti. Let's make this a bit bigger. And then we'll do, we'll say maximum images. Let's do all of the images. So if you don't, if you don't include maximum images, it'll just take all of them, right? So now you don't really have to shuffle uh, because it'll do all of the images anyway. So it doesn't really matter what order they're in. Um, so, okay, let's just leave shuffle off. And then we'll do output there. We'll call it graffiti. Let's, let's extract um, edges from them. Okay, and so I'll do edges. And then we'll do, let's do, let's make them a little bigger just so we can see the features better. So. Uh, Pixpix and CycleGAN will resize everything from 512 to 256 anyway, so you don't necessarily have to make it match exactly. Like the main thing is the aspect ratio. I just want to do 512 by 512 so we can see it. And then um, let's say that we will do another thing. By the way, you can ch you can save as JPEG or, or PNG if you want. Um, I think it does PNG by default. And let's say for uh, yeah, that's that's all. We don't need. We're not tracking faces. And so for action, here's what we'll do. I'm going to do, I'm going to sh first show you the, um, I, I've already forgotten what some of these are. Let's look at trace. I think trace is the canny edge detector. So we'll say this will be graffiti trace. And we'll combine them as well. Okay, so save mode to combine. Okay. So let's let's see what that looks like. Once it imports, it's going to start processing them, and we can we can actually look at the results. Okay, 
So now it's made a new folder called graffiti trace. So let's look at them. All right, so here's your, this is what trace does. It's basically a candy edge detector and really thick lines. You can change the code in this if you want to get different effects. Um, candy edge detection is sort of like the most um, like straightforward way of doing edge detection, but it, it has some weaknesses, right? So it gives you a lot of random information, which may not be, which depending on what you're trying to accomplish may not be ideal. Um, like, it, so what I ended up doing was I ended up creating a method called simplify, which basically does a simplified edge detection using this, what's called holistic edge detection. Um, you, you can look at the code if you want to look at these in more detail, but if you do simplify, you will get um, you will get less lines, like the more important lines, and that's kind of useful if you're trying to create a drawing interface. So let's call this simplify. Um, so let's run that. But, um, but this edge detection algorithm does it rely on, uh, on machine learning or uh, the, which one? The the uh, the canny edge detector does not. Okay. It's a simple canny edge filter. Um, the HED though does, the holistic edge detection actually is a uh, network trained um, to do basically like give you the, you know, important lines basically. Um, okay, so let's see what that looks like. So now we have this folder, we can look at graffiti simplify. Okay, so this, it just has less lines. It may, it's, it's a little bit like candy would be bigger. Like if we find in a good example. That's random. Yeah, something like this. Like if you ran this through candy, you would have a lot more information. Um, I'm still working on trying to get this right. This is what I'm using for my um, my installation at Futurium, the, the the landscape generator. And I want to get like okay for something like this. I want to just get like what a human would draw, like the sketches, right? So that that's something I'm still working on. There's like a lot of strategies you could take. And I'm kind of trying to get a decent one right now. So if anyone's interested in, in actually doing something similar, then we can actually maybe like compare notes. Anyway, um, so we have this. So that's that's pretty decent. Let me let me show you one more. And I'll do instead of simplify. Let's look at the the example here. We have these actions. Um, we can do um, segmentation. So let's do the segment segmentation and quantization. Uh, let's look at segmentation. Um, oh, is it segment? Yeah, I actually, I think what this does is it gives you colored blobs, basically. Um, output, so segment. So this will let you, if you wanna do like, um, this will give you the simplified image uh, where all the colors have been, um, Actually, I can't remember what it's, oh, oops, I don't have TQDM. Um, I think I left that off of the, this isn't right, is this right? TQDM is not defined. Oh, oh, I think I have a, ah, I see, I see. Hold on a second, I'm gonna fix this right now. Um, uh, I have a little bug, I'm gonna, change that. I forgot to import TQDM in here. So you won't have to do this because I'm actually going to change it right now. Import from TQDM. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look and see how this looks. It's really quick. Some of them are faster than the others. Oh no, this one's actually really slow, right? Because it's using like a... Oh, I hope I'm not having some bugs here, but okay, let's see how that's coming out. This one's actually really slow, but let's, let's see, have a look. Um, right, so this does like color simplification. This also needs some work. It's kind of like, yeah. It's basically like color quantization. 
let's look at also and then one more I want to show you I'll interrupt this actually and I want to show you the um, trace oh no we did trace we uh, I wanted to show you what was it quantize. quantize yeah I think yeah that's also it should do a similar thing I think it quantizes the colors like posterization kind of quantize Okay, let's have a look and see that. Oh, what? That doesn't look right. Okay, obviously this this one is something's wrong. <laughs> so I'll fix that. Um, anyway, you get the idea. This utility lets you get different kinds of parallel data sets. Some of the some of them are like color, color to photo like like nearest color basically. Quantize should quantize the colors. I think I have a bug in the code that's making it copy the input for some reason, but I'll, I'll fix that. Okay, so let's look at now um, PyTorch. Uh, so we installed we installed um, pix to pix in TensorFlow, and um, so the, so let's let's actually train something. So first of all, this this if you just follow the instructions, this will show you how to. Um, uh, this will show you how to like do with the included examples. I'm going to uh, actually what I'll do is uh, I'll just skip this the maps data set and I'm gonna run pix to pix on my face landmarks right so let's actually give it a shot so basically I'll go Python train.py and here's what you need to do data root what where's your data so where's my data it's going to be dot dot slash ml for a guides utils and then what did I call it gene face gene face so that, that's all uh, that'll just grab the images inside of there uh, oh this is sorry this is cycle again so pix to pix train.py data root dash dash name so give it a name so let's say gene um, what do you let's like gene underscore face and then uh, dash dash model pix to pix Pix to pix, and then dash dash direction b to a or a to b. So b to a is right to left, a to b is left to right. Which way do we want to go? Um, let's go edges to face. I forget which way it actually was. So left to right. So a to b. A to b. And then one other thing you want to need to do is um, if you uh, um, if you're training it. They, they use this uh, utility called Visdom so that you can actually monitor the training in the browser while it's working. You can look at that in your own time if you wish to include it, but, but you have to launch a Visdom server um, and then you know have like a browser to look at. So you can do it inside of the, like you can do it from the desktop, the Paperspace desktop application. Um, but since we, we're not running that right now, I'm just gonna turn it off. And the way you turn it off is doing display underscore ID zero. So that's written in the documentation somewhere. Um, okay, so let's let's actually. Oh, and then I'll, let's also just train this for a lot less time. Well, here let, let's actually just because there's not that many images, so I think we can actually just go ahead and do this. And problem, uh, not a. Oh, I see. There needs to be a directory called train and test inside of there. So let me just quickly go into ML for a guides and so like it, it's it's expecting there to be a training and a test directory. So if I go to gene face, it just has all the images. So I'm just going to make a directory called train and make a directory called test and like let's put in let's just move like one of one or two of these into test so I'll say I'll move this one into test so that we can look at it later and I'll move this one as well into test and then the rest of them the rest of them I'm going to move all of these PNGs into train Okay, so now we just have a test folder and a train folder. Inside of train, we have all these images. Inside of test, we have these images. Okay, so now let's go back and run that command again. Okay, so it found 98 training images. It generates a new checkpoint called gene face. 
and it's going to now start to train. Now because there's only 98 images, this should train relatively fast. I don't want to let it train the whole time because I want to just show you some results. Um, in any case, it actually like, yeah, it goes really fast, right? It's going to do 200 epochs, it's already on epoch 2 because the batch size is, I guess, 64 and so it goes like one batch is like basically almost an entire epoch. So <laughs> normally you want to maybe have like on the order of let's say 1000 images or so. Um, but uh, I think it saves a checkpoint every five epochs. So in like a few seconds, we'll, and then it'll make samples. So we could look at the training samples uh, in as much as like just a few seconds from now. So what you'll see is if we go into the, uh, oh, oops. If we go here, we'll see we have PyTorch this, and then basically, um, the okay so checkpoints has our model being saved there's gene face and the way it works is okay it saves a checkpoint every five right so it'll go so it'll, you can just you know like like picks the picture take you at least like eight hours to train decently uh, like like with a good number of images maybe even less like maybe four hours or something like that it depends on your gpu also um this would obviously like would only be done yeah, like like if you had a thousand images, actually maybe it should take even less than that by now. In any case, like uh, we can look at actually the results. So we can we can download this. Uh, I'm gonna download this web folder, and we can just open this in an HTML page. Right, that's the first epoch. So here's the here's the real. Uh, image like the real landmarks this is the target and then this is the reconstruction um, obviously like after five epochs it's not that good um, still pretty impressive considering it's only been training for like a few seconds basically um, it'll get a lot better this this should not necessarily this is this is actually from the training set so this is actually like it's not fair it's cheating like it's better to evaluate it based on a test set which you can do so uh, by running um, by well, by running the testing script. So okay, we can download this again. Why two hundred epochs? It's arbitrary. Like the more, the better. To typically, I mean, uh, at some point it stops learning, so it doesn't really necessarily help that much. Is that for any GAN? Sorry. Is that for any GAN? Uh, no, no, no. I mean, it it, just, it really depends on the content of the images. Like, you know, if it's very, very homogenous, like, okay, one face, you could learn that really quickly. But landscapes, right, going to be a lot more difficult because there's just much more variety and sort of diversity inside the images. And so there's more to learn, basically. Um, there's, there's, it's more of an art than a science at this point. Like, uh, <laughs> um, Unfortunately, yeah. Is the concept of overfitting in this instance problematic, or will it just sort of pop? Like, it it is problematic. Yeah, actually, you could overfit, and, and that's a that that is a problem um, because then you will get bad results when you actually test. So this is kind of the, that's why it saves a checkpoint every five epochs. You could always like go back, roll back to one if you if you uh, like if you've trained for too long and overcooked it, so to speak. Um, let's just see how it's doing. Okay, 17 epochs. So I don't want to let this go for too long because like the point is that this will get better. Yeah, hopefully. Right. Um, let's try a different instance. Let's actually run it. Um, okay, while it's doing this, I'm actually going to go to, let's do this on the uh, graffiti, which one worked pretty well, segmented. It might be interesting to check this out. Let's try the graffiti segmented. I'm going to go into that seg segment. And, uh, oh, there's only a few images. Okay, that's not enough. Uh, let's actually then just go to graffiti simplify. So that'll also be edges. Let's make a directory train mkdir test. And let's just take a few of these random images and move them to test. It tests every every uh, time it saves a checkpoint, which is every five. Um, uh, 
And let's just do one more. Okay, and then I'll move the rest of these to train. Oops. So here's train, here's test. Okay, cool. So now let's go back to um, to a cycle again here. Um, and let's see how it's looking. Okay, so actually, <laughs> let's. I'm gonna prepare another thing. Like, okay, here's here would be something funny. Um, Let's see if we can do this in the space of this class. I'm going to try to use the scraping scraper utility. Okay, this is going to be a challenge to do this in, in this class, but I'm gonna I have I have a cool idea and let's see if we can make make this work. So scrapers. So remember our scrapers that we showed last last week. So I'm going to go into the let's let's try Bing first. Oh really? Yeah, let me try it. Oh. I posted an issue on GitHub and I'm going to oh, fix it. Okay. Okay. Let's just go to the images. Python, my, what was it, script that it, and then it was like, how do you, what was the, it's just quotes. Okay. Uh, okay. So, clown face. <laughs> I'm basically going to try to make a cycle again that turns my face into clowns. Like, I haven't tried this, so I don't know if it's going to work. And then we have to pick like, okay, let's do 300. Oh, um, oh, what is, oh, it's Python 3. All right. Okay, so I'm really sorry about this, guys. Like, uh, <laughs> I don't even know if this is going to work that well. Um, but... Yeah, it, 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 okay, well, it seems to be, like, sort of reasonably working right now. Yeah, it's like over, over 100 something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, in any case, like, this is, at the moment, this is working. So, what I want to do is, while that's doing, like, okay, let's, let's try to see where we're at with this. And, uh. I don't want to use Chrome at the same time because it's it's oh there's a, okay there's like a weird um, oh <laughs> right oh how do you do this like I want to open that in Chrome here open with no, not, uh, sorry, in Safari. Oh, Safari's fine, okay. Because if you try to use it at the same time, it might screw up the... Okay. <laughs> so in any case, like, that might not be working already, but let's, let's see. Okay, now it's getting a lot better, right? Right, so you get the idea. This will, this will train a pretty... So then once you could, you could then extract this from your own face and then run it through and you, you can mimic my face if you'd like um, for anyone who wants to make a clown out of me yeah. well um, let me now escape this okay so now the okay so I don't know if we got that many clowns but let's actually have a look documents gene scrapers google images clowns there they are Unbelievable. Okay. I only got 53 images, but that's, that's, it's enough to give it a shot. So I'm going to just upload these over here. So let's go to uh, ML Prey Guides, Utils, and let's throw these clowns over here. And I'm going to now extract, like I'm going to make crops of them. So basically, we'll go into here and we'll do Python dataset utils. Input source is going to be JPEG, right? So that we'll grab that and then output there will be clowns. Save mode will be output only. We're just going to crop them. 
So basically the action will be none. And then I'm going to say, let's say 256 by 256, dash dash h, 256, centered. Um, and I think, I think that should be uh, centered. So we're not looking for any particular face. Uh, I don't want to run the face tracker because that might, uh, it might not find faces everywhere. So that's kind of, um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's about all. So let's, uh, let's give it a shot and uh, go. So what this should do, it should give me a folder of centered clown faces. I should go pretty quickly. There's not that many of them, but okay. Okay, good. So we have that. Now I want to do the same thing, except just get myself. So we'll go from input source. We'll take that movie again, gene to that MP4, gene um, face only. Let's see. Uh, output only action none to six hundred. Uh, oh, and then this one, uh, we actually do want to because my face is quite visible. So let's say target face image gene two twenty seven, and then um, and we actually do want to pull out the face basically. So this will be output only, and uh, let's give that a shot. So there's clowns. So let's have a look and see gene face only. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Um, what is it? I, I know it's not this. It should be remove RF gene face only. It should be, um, actually let's do this. Like we'll, we'll do split and then, and then I'll just take, yeah. And then also face crop. We'll say, we'll make that like 0 0.7 again, and that should work. In face crop, this refers to how tight the crop is? Um, uh, like how, what percentage of the, of the box is taken up by the face? Okay, so now, right, so we have this train B. So I have, okay, so I have these inside of train B. And, uh, oh, I also wanted a shuffle. One other thing, sorry. Um, shuffle and max num images. So let's say shuffle and then max num images. We'll say like, okay, like 80, you know, or 70, let's say. Because it should roughly match what you have. Okay, so let's just quickly run that. How's this doing? 60 epochs? And basically, okay, once that's done, I'm going to make a folder uh, that has two folders inside of it, train A and train B. And train A and train B will have like, okay, the, the um, face, uh, my face, and then the other folder will have clown faces. That'll be train B. And then we can try to train cycle gamma and, and, and <laughs> we'll see. I don't think we'll have enough time to really get decent results. It'll probably just like disfigure me slightly, but like, I, I don't know. Well, we can kind of like give it a shot. Um, okay, so that is almost done. So you can see that train A, so, and actually what I wanna do is I wanna just keep this. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, so that, right, okay, so we have these, just a bunch of these. So I'm going to, what I'm actually gonna do is I'm actually going to delete train A. I'm gonna rename this to train A because I want I want it to be A to B where I go from, from gene face to clown face. So we're going to do this and then what I'll do is I'm gonna make a new directory 
inside of there, gene face only, uh, called train B. And I'm going to move all of the clown faces to train uh, gene face only train B. So now if we look at this, this gene face only, and why don't we name, rename it gene face only to gene clown. So now this is gene clown, and there it is. So train B is a bunch of clowns, train A is a bunch of genes. So let's actually, first of all, let's, um, let's get, oh, Let's get the last version of this just to see how it's, how it's doing. Um, we can open this with Safari. So getting closer, right? Reconstruction. So this is kind of counting down from the epochs from the beginning. So in the beginning, it's really bad. And then after a few minutes, it's actually like quite acceptable. OK, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to delete that. And I'm going to go back to this. And I'm going to stop this. Sometimes I stop it incorrectly. I have to delete some of these things. Like every, every now and then, if, you, if you're running out of memory, like you, have, you might have some zombie processes that you have to kill. So I'm going to kill this. I'm going to kill this and kill that. And now my memory should be back. OK. So let's go look at this paper space. Uh, oh, where is it? OK. Cycle again training. So here's what we'll do. We're going to train. We're going to run Python train.py dash dash data root. So where is? my data set that's going to be an ml for a guides oh, um, ml for a guides utils gene clown and then because it should be looking for two subfolders in there train a and train b I, I might have i might have gotten the names wrong i might have to change that in a second but let's okay now we'll go dash dash name gene clown and then model cycle again uh, and display id zero I think that should work. Let's see if this, okay, right. Oh, see, it's not train underscore, it, it's just typo. So it needs train A and train B. I have a train underscore, train underscore. Um, so basically like if we just go back to here, Gene Clown, I'm just gonna rename this to train B. So like they're, they're all looking for specific directory structures, uh, but that should basically work. So now if I go back, Training images 70, um, that makes sense. So now it's going to start training cycle again to convert um, gene faces to clown faces. Yeah. So we can kind of let this go. I'm gonna let this proceed for now. And in the meantime, while it's training, I wanna show you the next thing, which is I wanna show you how to use dense cap uh, because dense cap is kind of cool. And I think uh, there should be a dense cap module inside of Runway at some point. I think maybe Chris is going to uh, have that in, in there. Um, so that will make it a lot easier to use. Um, in the meantime, let me actually quickly go to the slides. So just in terms of um, setting up dense cap, if you, I have a, a little script that you just need to copy and then run and it'll do ev all of the setup for you. It should work on the empty paper space instance. You can actually run a single line command, which is the thing up top. Of course, that's really hard to read. So I'm actually just going to show you where it is. Um, so basically, if you go to um, my gist, gist.github.com com slash gene kogan it's the last gist that i made which is paper space dense cap so the, all of this has to be run and then it'll basically like i can actually like just save it um so like i'll go into terminal and i'll go like um i'll go to cd from this from here and i'm going to just like if you do touch that'll create a new file so like um, setup 
mscap.sh. And now I can actually just like go back to here and you'll see I have this new empty file and I can open it and I'm gonna copy all of that in there. Okay, so this uh, I think should work. Basically, let's save that. Okay, so that's in there now. And now I can go into here and I can go sh, set up densecap.sh and it should start installing stuff. And this will take like maybe five or 10 minutes or something like that. What it's doing is it's basically setting up all of the torch libraries that densecap needs. It's also installing CUDNN, which densecap also needs. Um, there's a bunch of like random little bugs I had to fix that, that like I'm just gonna, I'm trying to save everybody time because it's just like random stuff. So like for example, it's actually, I had to make a fork you see Gene Kogan in there. I had to make a fork of this because it wasn't installing properly and I figured out the, the fix in the in the spec and now now it should install it on the template uh, on the fresh paper space instance um, like pretty pretty easily. It'll also download the pre-trained models for you which is which you need to run Densecap uh, and then it'll test it on the picture of an elephant. So now uh, we can let that go. Let's see how the training is going. Cyclegan seems to be trained a little bit slower than uh, pix to pix it seems like. Um, so this might take a little bit longer. It also has more images. Um, we're probably not going to get very far, far for this. But, um, but the, okay, so like the, the cool thing to, to note is that um, obviously like I'm, I'm, I'm pretty quick at this, but, but you can see like how fast you can get a good idea and like get it to execution. And we have, uh, all of the steps are saved inside of this video, as you'll see. Fresh paper space instance, setting up ML for a guide, setting up PyTorch, scraping something from scratch, like all the tools are kind of there. And I hope that someone else does the clown thing because I'd really like to see how that works. Um, we'll see how that works in a moment. I think it'll save after five epochs and it's probably not going to be that good, but we'll, you know, we can get a sense for it. Um, okay, well, while DenseCap is, is installing, um, yeah, I should have started doing this earlier. While Densecape is installing, I wanted to quickly check in with my slides and see what other things I wanted to show you. Okay, so we have Densecap. Okay, face, uh, Wikiart segmentation, Wikiart scraping, cycle again. Pixpix HD is maybe worth uh, looking into really quickly just to, just to see it. Um, I don't think I'm gonna clone it right now just because we don't have enough time, but I do wanna show it to you. Um, and then uh, that should more or less take us to the end of the class. Like once we can look at and see how the cycle again is, is training and then also tr try out dense cap. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm doing things a little bit out of order because we're waiting for stuff to happen. Um, but, um, but yeah, but that's okay. So um, I'm showing you picks to picks and cycle again, but it turns out that there is uh, a really nice picks to picks HD developed by NVIDIA that lets you synthesize and generate images up to 2048 by 1024. Um, doing 10, uh, 2048 by 1024 requires a lot of GPU. So that's probably not something that I would advise trying to do right away. However, um, doing 1024 by 512, you can do, I think, solidly on a paper space instance. Um, and, and we can kind of see how it works. Basically, like it has, um, like you, you generate data sets in much the same way that you do with picks to picks. They have to be parallel. This is not cycle again. It's just, it's just picks to picks. And um, you put them into, you don't concatenate them as with the other picks to picks. You actually put them into split folders. Um, so there's like a train, a, it's actually train underscore A and train underscore B. And then it will, it'll grab, um, and you have to make sure that your images are like named the same and have the same ind indices because it has to be able to match them. It's a, it's a, well, the, the data set utils will do this all for you so you don't have to worry about it. In any case, like, um, okay, you could do high resolution face synthesis. Um, you also have to install Dominate, um, which which you can just do this way. And then, okay, this is this will get you from zero to 60, like, Clone Pixpix HD, CD into the directory. Okay, and then um, there's a pre-trained model that if you want to use, you can download it from there. That's the label to city, so that'll generate these. 
Um, but basically what it's looking for is it's looking for a very specific directory structure. So like if you wanted to train the model, you would have to do the following. I'm, I'm actually going to like go through, I'm not, we don't have it. So, so here, let me, let me actually just like, uh, yeah, the, the, tra it would be like this. You'd basically do pi if you were inside of Pixpix HD, you would run something like Python train.py. You would give it a name. Uh, and the name has to be the same as the name of the folder that contains your images. So like if you had a folder of images going HD images going from face tracker to faces, right? So like you had a gene face or whatever and gene face is a folder that has train underscore a and train underscore B inside of it. So you would do this and then you would also need to do give it data root, which is what is the root folder that contains the folder called gene face? Like maybe you have a date like you maybe you have like a my data sets, right? So your folder that has gene face is like my data sets and you have gene face in there, right? So then you do, you do it this way and then it'll look for my data sets, gene face, train A, train B, right? And then you would, um, I think that's actually all, uh, what is that? That's training. If you could do uh, multiple GPUs actually this way really easily, but otherwise that's that's really actually all you need to do, I think as far as I remember. Um, oh, you also have to do this. Like if you're doing it the same way we're doing it where there's, you're not using what are called instance maps, which we're not because don't worry about them. Then you also have to do no instance. Uh, I think, I think is that, uh, oh no, no, sorry, sorry. You would do, right, you would do no instance. How is it? Um, instance no instance right so you do no instance and then also like if you're if you don't have us if you don't have label uh, if your label apps are just like colored if you just want to go you, you could you basically you would do label nc zero this means that um there's no specific amount of labels it's just doing color to color transfer um just do, you'll you'll probably for your purposes you'll always have these more or less. So if you run that, it would start to train. And then if you do the same thing, except test.py, it'll, it'll, it'll look for a folder test A and test B and then, and then do the experiment on those. I'm sorry for rushing through the Pix6 HD one, just don't have that, that much time. Uh, but it, but just know that it works very, very similarly to pix to pix And all you really have to do is read through the documentation. The installation should work on paper space like easily. In fact, it has, um, it's PyTorch, so we already installed CycleGAN and pix to pix And um, so if you install those first, this should work out of the box. You'll have to do install one more thing, which you could do with pip install dominate. Um, otherwise, it should work right out of the box. Um, so yeah, that's pix to pix HD. You can see that the code actually borrows from, from the PyTorch one. Uh, let's actually see how we're doing. So we've gone through eight epochs here, so maybe we have something to look at. And how's dense cap? Dense cap is still building. So let's actually quickly. Um, and all these processes are, are running on the same machine, or do you have multiple paper spaces open? The, uh, these are. I have one paper space open right now. We're, we actually just have two uh, SSH uh, windows into them right now at the same time. Yeah. Uh, let's actually quickly see if we have any checkpoints. So there's Gene Clown. There's web. It saves every five. Um, I kind of want to like let it get until ten <laughs> because I feel like five is gonna. Well, let's look at them both at the same time. It'll update after ten. So like, let's let that go. This is still building. This is still gonna be a little while. Um, uh, while this is building, though, I want to like upload. Okay, we'll we'll, we'll do it in a minute we'll, when it's up there. I don't want to confuse you. Like, let's let's. Focus on the task here. Yeah. yeah. A general question about yes. Checkpoints. Sure. Um, it, it is possible with most of these models to train train a checkpoint for x number of epochs and then take that same checkpoint and begin training it again, right? Yeah. 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 Sure. Uh, and, and there's a flag for that. Actually, uh, with PixPix cycle again, you don't even if you just give it the same if you run it twice in a row, it'll 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 look in that directory and it'll see there's a checkpoint there and it'll load it from scratch. I don't think you have to tell it to continue training, but we can, 
we can maybe double check that. Um, so if you look at options, train options, it's like, I think continue. Oh, you do? Okay, yeah. You also have to do this dash dash continue train. And then uh, don't forget that because otherwise it will start over. And, and then just start overwriting the checkpoints. Here, if you do dash dash continue train, it'll grab the last one and then uh, begin to um, begin to go from the latest. Yeah. And you can actually have it continue training from a from a different checkpoint. See, you would do dash dash which epoch. And so if you like the model at a previous state and you want to, this is a cool way of doing transfer learning actually. So you can train Pixspace HD for a while. Uh, uh, oh, so, okay, sorry. I'm looking at the Pixspace HD documentation. It's probably similar for CycleGen, but it might not be. It might just do it automatically. So if we go options, is it the same? Yeah, it's the same, right. So you dash dash continue train, and you can, um, oh, it doesn't let you, oh yeah, right, epoch count, starting epoch count. Oh, maybe this will just grab the latest. Yeah, this will actually grab the latest. It doesn't let you uh, load a particular one, actually. That's as far as I can tell. Uh, but okay, so yeah, dash dash continue train. And it'll keep on training. Yeah, so that's that's useful. So I have yeah. A related question. Let's say you train for like um, five hundred epochs and you overfit one. Can you generate the samples by just changing the number? Of so let's say I want to go back to 100. Yeah, so it saves them every five, let's say. And you can change this frequency that which it saves also if you want to. Okay. And actually, like, the way it knows to grab the last one is that it actually always holds a copy, yeah. uh, which is just called latest. See? It just has these. And what you could do is, like, okay, if you like them better at 15 than the last one, then you can just make a copy of 15. You can just rename those oh. to latest. It, it just, like, these are actually copies, straight up copies. Okay, so rename the checkpoint you want to go back to, to latest. Yeah. Then, okay, got it. Okay, let's actually download this web. Let's see how the clown face thing is doing. <laughs> and how's this? Oh, good, this is almost done. So let's look at clown faces. Right. Oh, oh, that's kind of neat. So, it, um, yeah, well, <laughs> that's great. I, I mean, okay, like after five epochs, six epochs, okay, generates this in six, it, um, it knows to like color my hair red and make my face white. So that's pretty good. Like we, ha we did almost zero pre-processing of the clowns, right? It has clowns, like their faces are in different places. Like the, the, the images of my face are actually re relatively um, centered all the time. But the clowns, uh, the clowns are all over the place, right? And it actually still was able to find faces. So face transfer works really, really well. Like this would, this would actually, like if we train this for long enough, it'll, it'll work. It'll totally work. In fact, in fact, I, I'm going to do this. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I, I've claimed this. Um, Exactly. Oh, that's, yeah, it's a good point. Is today Halloween? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. All right. I don't have a costume. What should I do? Clown. Clown. <laughs> Clown it shall be. Okay. Oh, look at that. We're just in time. Okay. So here's, uh, it's serving HTTP. So we can actually go look at this now. Uh, let's go to, we're almost done, guys. Uh, I'm going to go into open the desktop. So it's running a local server to visualize the, the results of DenseCap. Do this cancel. So we're inside our paperspace computer, local host 8000, and these are our DenseCap results, our view results. Okay, so that's the, and that's the example image that it comes with. Can't, uh, you see they're color coded. We don't. If they're, it's a little small here, but um, I can't resize it any bigger. Okay, people riding on an elephant, dirt and dirt on the ground. What's that? I was just gonna say, this has an electron app, so you can like properly size it to your window. Oh, it does. Okay, I didn't know that. Um, 
In any case, okay, people writing an output. Let's let's give it something more interesting. Uh, okay, someone call out an image, or like a funny something funny that you want to see captioned. Somebody, anybody. Okay, <laughs> so much enthusiasm, like yeah, free Willy. Like, <laughs> How's this? Oh, we need a bigger one. I think that's a great idea. Okay. <laughs> Oh, that's not free willy. What's going on? Um, okay, let me just save this. Oops. Free willy. JPEG. And I'm going to upload this to DenseCap. Okay, find free willy. We'll throw that in there. Okay, and now I'm going to go and do, um, where is it? So we can look at the dense cap. So basically you'll do run model on the input image and where is that input image? So we'll do Run model, input image, free willy, uh, JPEG. It'll open the model, it'll run it, and then we can visualize the results. Okay, it'll take a second. And then basically this is how to launch the server that visualizes the results. Okay, good. Oh, uh, actually for us, it right, so this, if you look at that script, um, Set up dense cap. It actually has, yeah, this is the way to do it with Python 3. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, hang on a second. There it is. Kill. Oops. There we go. Go back to here. Where is our, there it is. Cloudy sky, black and white kite. A black and white kite. The water is blue. Clouds in the sky, a large body of water. The head of a person, the man is standing on the water. A man holding a surfboard. The water is blue, blah, blah, blah. Um, neat, right? Um, let's do. Okay, well, we've run out of time, so I should. Basically, okay. The idea is like you can get a lot of really funny things to, to do. Um, so okay, so we looked at dense cap, we looked at cycle again, we looked at pix pix, we looked briefly at pix space HD. We did some stuff with uh, data set utils. Does anyone have any questions on the stuff that we looked at? We don't have enough time to look at YOLO, but but um, I definitely like try to set it up on your laptop. It should work on a laptop. Um, and it doesn't need C, uh, doesn't need CUDA necessarily. Um, any questions? Uh, okay. Uh, any like uh, okay. So continue to work on uh, setting up your paper. Once you have it going, like one of the DC GAN or picks to picks, you'll see that all of them are the same. You read through the documentation. You see the command line. You know the file structure that it's expecting. Um, you get used to, it. and then all of these things kind of become more or less interchangeable. Um, next week we're going to introduce recurrent neural networks um, that will be really fun like RNNs and LSTMs and talk about natural language processing applications and sketch RNN is something else I want to look at um, so we're gonna yeah this thing, we're gonna keep on keep on keeping on okay um, any questions cool okay cool so then uh, I'll see you guys next week and yeah I'll be I'll be around today if anyone wants to meet downstairs and I'll be here office hours tomorrow 12 to Six.
Yeah, yeah, just email me. Um, yeah.